first take on gaming weekly PCs, consoles, and handhelds. Mm-hmm. Bump what you heard since birth on this earth. We know that the future belongs to the nerds. Revolve alive. What you say? Revolve alive. Every Sunday at six, bringing that gaming magic to your life. Doing it live on Twitch to show that you don't want to miss. Be sure to subscribe. Crack yourself a brew. If it work, are you who now? You can join the crew for the ride. Xbox, mobile, and hot topics around the nation. To gaming rigs, headsets, hardware, and PlayStation. Shout out to Joe. Can't you see him glow? Token brother brought the flow. Now it's time for the show. Let's go. go. What's going on, guys? Welcome to Revolver Live, the gaming podcast. It says, forget the past. The future belongs to the nerds. And I'm a big nerd. I'm the Beastly Gamer. Today, I'm joined by my three amazing co-hosts, cohorts and co-conspirators, the king of all things Destiny, and now Destiny 2, Briar Rabbit. How you feeling today, sir? I am feeling ground. Ground. The grind is on. <laughs> we are in the middle of the grind. Get it on yeah, like a stripper at the Ohio State Fair. Grinding hard right now. I met my wife at the Ohio State Fair, bro. Unrelated. Unrelated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling that grind myself for the first time in a long she time. She just really I'm... liked your moves up on the dance floor. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. I was doing, you know, old school 70s shit. Mm-hmm. I can still moonwalk, by the way. Ryan Wilson, how you feeling, my friend? Welcome. I'm feeling tired, but I'm feeling good, man. I'm B2 sure you is are. Out. The, like Briar said, the grind is on and feeling it, but loving uh, I... it. I know you are. I was a little late to the party. You know, work and family antics slowed me down for about a day or so, but I'm trying so hard to catch up. And speaking of catch up, what's going on, Mr. Gary Diaz? How you feeling, my friend? Feeling amazing. Ready to get swifty in here. Take down my pants and shit on the floor. I think that's the uh, the gag. That's <laughs> You always give me something to play with in my mind. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, you make my imagination. Is that where the Weedabix before. comes from? <laughs> <laughs> it must be. Before we get started with today's episode of Revolver Live, we would like to uh, send our thoughts and prayers to everyone who've been affected by Hurricane Irma, uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, Her- Hurricane Jose, any of these horrible hurricanes that have been bombarding the southern coast of the United States and other lands as well. Right now, Hurricane Irma is ripping through Florida, and uh, there have already been loss of life, and, and many, many people have lost pretty much their entire lives behind these hurricanes and some of us especially when you're in other lands or up north it's really hard to put into into context what this really means but for me seeing what was going on uh in in texas initially the aftermath of that and then now what's going on with hurricane irma which is even stronger than harvey and especially with it moving further up north it's supposed to be here where i live in the next uh 18 to 24 hours so of course we're on standby it's a terrible thing and for anyone who's been affected by these horrible horrible hurricanes we would like to send you guys our thoughts and our prayers agreed welcome to revolver live revolver (laughs) live is a gaming podcast with six revolving topics we go live every sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. That's twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. The video's then shared on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's channel and my channel, Beastly Gamer. If you're unable to see the live feed or video format, be sure to check us out in podcast form on Podbeans, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. And with that said, welcome to Revolver Live, Episode 8, Destiny 2. Has yeah, the fallen. one about Destiny 2, right? Because that is what we want to talk about. That's what we've all been playing this week. Uh, I actually, right up before the podcast, we had to stop playing Destiny 2. Uh, Gary Wilson and I were literally grinded new characters so that we could uh, move all our gear over from our original characters and get to a higher power level. Uh, Beastly, you've been playing all weekend. Uh, We already have made plans to play next weekend, the four of us together. I mean, Destiny is what's on our mind. Destiny 2 is out. It's on our mind. And that's what we want to talk about. And then we got a really good topic for the end uh, that Wilson brought up. And I can't, I actually can't wait to talk about that one too. So let's talk about some Destiny 2, guys. Uh, you know, obviously, when you first booted up, you're confronted by the story. So why don't we just jump off with the story? Oh, before we do that, should we throw out our disclaimer? I think that's a good idea. Yes, we should, definitely. Yeah. Uh, today's episode of Revolver Live <laughs> will have light spoilers. For Destiny 2's story campaign, uh, I actually haven't completed the campaign. I'm very close to it. I would say uh, I'm I'm already level 20. You know, over 200 light. I thought I was the man until I heard about these guys' power today. 
but there will be light spoilers. So if you don't want anything spoiled, uh, you might want to check back with us after you play through the campaign. Yeah, we're we're not gonna we're gonna try and stay away from spoilers, but uh, let's be honest with you. Sometimes it slips out. We're, we might be talking about some exotics. We might be talking about uh, characters. We might be talking about locations. They could be spoilers. So if you haven't made it through the campaign, you might want to tune in. You know, on Tuesday or Wednesday after you finish the campaign. Uh, of course, you can always find the show up on uh, Podbean or iTunes or your f- wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. Yeah, that's really where you want to go. <laughs> All right, so let's do it. Story. What do you guys think? Beastly. First impression. You're, you're not finished with it yet. But what no, do you I'm think not. about the story so far? Uh, so far, I've, I've put, I would say, probably 15 to, 15 to 18 hours into this game. Mm-hmm. I haven't completed the story. I'm sure if I went just straight for story plot points and just story missions, I would have beat the game already. But my wife and I, we played this together. We really have been enjoying it. So we've been kind of branching off and doing side quests and things like that to kind of give a little bit more weight to the experience. This is everything I wanted from Destiny 1. That's, I a, didn't know. that's actually, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's a big change from Destiny 1, right? Is that in Destiny 1, you mainline the story because that's what was in front of you. That's in Destiny 2, the story's right in front of you, but there's... It so many other act- things to do. Yeah, it instantly opens up kind of other activities to do kind of between story missions. You have the uh, adventures public to events. run. You have public events to run. Uh, you can do all, kind of a lot of stuff. You can you can start repping up your your factions. Like there's all sorts of stuff. You you told me before the show that you're level 20 and you haven't finished the story yet. Uh, so you, you've been playing a lot of that side content while you've been going through the story. I, I yeah, just find it I'm- interesting. It's a big difference from Destiny 1 to 2. It is, and, and that's one of the things about Destiny that a lot of people have issues with is that the streamlined story that was crafted was really all you had until later months where all this other stuff was kind of added. Uh, that's the first thing we saw. When we first started playing through the campaign, we were actually able to join a, a fire team together because you got to play through about two or three missions before you can do that. As soon as we landed uh, on Earth, there were other things for us to do. Uh, and, and to me, that was a huge plus. Another thing I'll say in, in my first impression to the story is that it's crafted in a way that really draws you into the story. There are lots of cutscenes. A lot of the characters from the original game, uh, of course, we saw this toward the end of Destiny 1. They're bursting with personality. You know what these people are all about. There's so many aspects of this game that have you, you know, your side busting because you're laughing about the things that are being said. And uh, to me, it's just been a very enjoyable experience overall so far. Everything I've done so far, you know, I've been in the Crucible, I've done uh, uh, strikes, uh, I've just played through campaign and done side questions in the adventures. I love it all, and I think if, if this is what we can expect in the future, this will this will be a game I'll play all year. Uh, I haven't wanted to play anything else. Of course, it's a new game, but what we've done so far has been very rewarding, extremely rewarding, and I'm loving it so far. What do you guys think? You guys are more versed in the world of Destiny. Well, I'll, what are your I'll be first like, impression? Loading in, like, first thing that you notice is it's very gorgeous. It's a very gorgeous space. Um, sure definitely feels a little bit more open and alive than Destiny 1. Destiny 1, it kind of seemed like there was a schedule to things. Like, not even necessarily, like, with the weekly reset or anything like that. But it felt too, I don't know, artificial, I guess would be the word. And uh, going into D2, it really felt like the the world was very much alive and a lot of the stuff was happening around you. I don't know if you guys kind of felt that too. It just felt like it's not an open world game, but it felt like the stuff that was happening made it seem a little bit more open world. Like it was just very much more alive and vibrant. And it was very clear at, at the beginning of what you're going to be up against and, you know, who who the bad guys are and... It uh, it was just such a great feeling, like loading in and w- without really like spoiling, like the very beginning before you even play, is what I thought was one of the coolest parts where they kind of yeah. just. I don't think that's a spoiler. Their... We could talk about that, right? We could yeah, talk about that where it's exposition. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, literally so the first thing you see when you boot the game up. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, you boot the game up. First thing you see is everything, all of your triumphs that you've done, like, yeah, that you've done in Destiny One, who you did them with, and the date. Yeah. So the like kicker it was for really... me is the who, right? It's yeah. like yeah. some of those people don't necessarily play Destiny anymore. So it was like the first time I'd seen their names in quite some time. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was only like one or two out of mine that just kind of moved on. Like they're they're back for D two, but they just kind of moved on to other games, you know. And that's totally mm -hmm. fine. Um, and, and I saw Briar's name on everything that I ever accomplished in Destiny One. So I'd like to thank you, sir. <laughs> everything that I ever done, any raid that I done, I think I done three or four. In the history of Destiny 1, you were on them all. So I really appreciate you holding my hand through that. You won't have to do it this time, but everything I've done was you. So, Briar the Carry <laughs> Rabbit. I love you, like, but uh, yeah, I thought that was like, I mean, within seconds of booting up the game, like I went to GameStop, did the whole midnight release thing, also got it at 10 p.m. my time. So that was cool. I got it an hour earlier than the digital release. Um, but it was just like really cool to have that hype for like a midnight release, get the game, come home. You're upset that like all the stoplights are turning red. Yeah. <laughs> trying to fucking race home. Yeah, you're you're trying to race home as safely as you can. You get home and you're in a hurry and you boot it up and this thing stopped me dead in my tracks. And I think Hugo said it the best, uh, hit me right in the feels, man. Like a lot of these guys are still playing. They're in real life friends. We have each other's phone numbers. Uh, so it was really cool looking back, man, seeing that. One thing Eric. I'll say that I, I think was a very wise decision on Bungie's part for Destiny 2, it was kind of a big change and it caught me off guard. And I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, but in Destiny 2, you start off initially without a Sparrow. And uh, in Destiny 1, having that Sparrow made everything seem immediately accessible. Everything yeah. seemed easier. And with you have to you have to go through the entire game, I believe, before it will almost the entire game because I have one now. But um, before you get a sparrow, and to me that makes the game you appreciate it more. You know when you actually have to use Tom and Jerry to get everywhere, you see more, and and, and usually you'll see something that piques your interest or you'll find something interesting when you actually have to you know walk the distance. It just makes the game seem more heavy to me, and it's not as easily accessible as part one. So I, I really appreciated a step back in that direction to kind of make you appreciate the game more. Did anyone else notice that? Yeah, absolutely. I felt like it was kind of a good touch because like you did kind of need to slow down and realize the like vastness of the situation yeah. of what was going on and that it was pure chaos. You shouldn't just be able to race race around all willy nilly you know on your sparrow you know there's an invasion and they know you're there and you're not feeling too hot either that was another thing too at the <clears throat> beginning story man the the music can we talk about the music for a second oh, like yeah. in the game yeah. like dude the music really nailed it like if it's getting if you're if you're about ready to go rock some cabal it's going to get you pumped if yeah. you need to slow down and realize the situation and how like serious it is, like it gives you a really nice sad tone, and like that music freaking nailed it, man. I don't know how many times I got goosebumps. Yeah. I'll, the, I'll the, the, game. the music in Destiny One I thought was fantastic, and all the expansions I thought was fantastic. The music in Destiny Two, it builds on a lot of the themes of Destiny One, but it adds so much more. Like, like tonally. It's so much more varied than in Destiny One, right? It's like the, just sometimes you listen to like smooth jazz, sometimes you listen to like hard rock, sometimes you're listening to like orchestras and like you know humming monks. It's like it's across the board, and it almost always fits the action that you're performing to a T. It's amazing. Yeah, it kind of struck me a bit like um, at least the opening of the game, where it's very somber and melancholic. It struck me a bit like The Last of Us in terms of the feel. Mm -hmm. Like kind of like that guitar feel, and I know that would uh, probably hit you right in the feels there, basically. But you know, when you're you you just kind of recovered from the fall, let's say, um, and and your your guardian's taking his first steps as a as a you know as, as a character you're controlling. Um, yeah, that really struck me as kind of like the same feeling you got when you left the city and The Last of Us and walked out into the woods for the first time, and you just saw the openness and the vastness, and you had that. I guess it's what is it like a, a classical guitar kind of riff mm -hmm. almost coming yeah, down there. Yeah, you're right. That kind of feel really hit me. Uh, something I'll say about my initial thoughts. We're talking about the story a little bit and our impression to the story. I felt that the the character arc or what you're going through in this game 
meant so much to me. Uh, and, and again, for me, it's something that, you know, you're pulling back layers of what made Destiny 1 so popular, but making people appreciate that power. And Destiny 1, you feel like an incredible badass from the moment you really start playing the game. And in this game, you know, that's kind of ripped away from you in a very meaningful way. And not only that, the people who you care about in this world also feel the effects. And, and, and the same thing is happening around, I guess, the universe, the people who have the power you have. And for you to lose that and have to go through what you, you're going through in this story and gradually regaining it, to me, it makes that power, you appreciate it so much more. You know, you actually have to work for it. And I, I think that was a very smart move, again, by Bungie, to make you really appreciate the power that they're giving you because you have to actually work for it this time. And so, so I, I, I have a different opinion on, on the story uh, myself. Okay. So I think the story was good. I think that it was there was a story, which is one of the biggest criticisms of, of Destiny 1 is that there was no story. You know, it was a, a game without a story. And I feel this one, there was a nice sci-fi story that had all the beats that you expect to see from a sci-fi story. You know, um, you had the fall, the return, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and everything else you, you want in between. What I was hoping for and what I got were two very different things, though. And I take you back to the D2 reveal event where we got a cinematic that I haven't seen in game since, which was Zavala talking about what it means to be a guardian and him falling down and getting resurrected and coming back up and building the tower. And I'd recommend if you haven't seen that, if you're new to Destiny 2 and you haven't seen that trailer, to have a look at the Destiny 2 reveal of, I don't know what it's called, I don't know if anyone knows what the, the title of that is. Um, sure. but, but what makes a guardian, I think, was kind of the theme. And... I felt right. Okay, now I'm going to find, um, you know, the, the 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 allies that I have have scattered throughout the cosmos, and I'm now trying to piece back my my allies. And what I'd like to have seen is is um, a redemption arc for each character when I discover them. So I'm I'm not going to go into deep spoilers here, but I find Zavala, and he's having a question of conscience as has he let the city down by the cabal came in. Wouldn't it be great now to revisit him and look at moments in his past that have taken him to where he is now and him remembering what made a guardian and then going forward with you? Because it, I don't know, I, I felt like the game was front loaded, heavy loaded on the front with great, really strong, you know, plot driven missions. And then I kind of felt like towards second and third acts, they were a bit lackluster and rushed out and that we were seeing character resolutions very quickly. I don't know if you, you got any of that and what you felt about seeing more from our vanguards and other characters that we encounter. So I, I hear you, and I, I somewhat agree with you, but I also think there's more um, w that we haven't seen yet. Um, some of some of the story, one of the problems with uh, Destiny 1 and its story and its lore was it was hidden in the grimoire, and you had to go to the website and read it there. Mm -hmm. uh, in Destiny 2... They put a lot of that back into the game, or put it into the game, um, and it's hidden. It's some of it is in adventures. Some of it was in the main story campaign, right? That uh, that campaign that you run like right at the beginning. Uh, but a lot more of it is hidden in adventures uh, and uh, missions that some I believe are not unlocked yet. I, I believe that we'll see more of these unlock as we go. Um, but the adventures, as you do the adventures, you get more lore, you get more story behind these characters. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, that's where it's going to be. And we'll see, you know, we'll see if all those adventures are available to us now or if they unlock over time. Um, I'm hoping that they do unlock over time because I think that'd be really interesting. Uh, I mean, so I, I do somewhat it. agree I just... with you. It did feel a little rushed at the end. Um, and like the final boss fight was a little anticlimactic for me. Um I, mean, I just feel like you've got your three vanguards and you've got the the stoic protector you've got the the jovial kind of gun you know uh, maverick mm -hmm. and then you've got the intellectual the academic and i'd love to when you um are encountering these characters in the same way you see that zavala cinematic i'd love to have had almost a micro campaign a cinematic a collection of cinematics you know you see a young zavala just freshly resurrected you see him progressing through and overcoming obstacles and everything else there and you might see Cade and you see 
why Cade's that way? Maybe he uses humour to mask, and, and if you know anything about Cade's backstory, a lot of the humour that he has is to mask great tragedy in his personal life, and, you know, he uses that as a coping mechanism, and you maybe see that there, and you understand a bit more as to, no, actually, Cade isn't just this, this arsehole who doesn't care about you, and Ikora, again, maybe, you know, she's she's trying to be intellectual and trying to be always um, right because there's been a big time when she's let down the vanguard or let down the warlock order and has been wrong about something and it's cost them big. So I'd love to have had that. And then you're the reason you take them on this redemptive journey. And that's why they find the strength to fight with you. I don't know. You mentioned, I, you mentioned that uh, cut scene that we haven't seen yet. We've seen it in the Dusty reveal, but we haven't seen it in game yet. My suspicion is there's more to come, right? Is it that even though we've played through the campaign, there's more to come. Well, for me, and, and again, I haven't completed the campaign. I feel like I'm pretty close uh, the vanguards have all recently become uh, in my circle. Let's just say that. But uh, upon finding Ikora, I felt like I had that moment with her. I felt like she did talk a little bit about the trials and the tribulations of, of being a guardian and the things she's gone through. And uh, the fact that she she doesn't necessarily feel like she she is all light or light only, that she's an individual. And I felt like, you know, that kind of arc mattered. And you know, maybe Zavala didn't have that moment yet, but we know that Destiny is a game that's made to last. And the fact of the matter is this uh, cinematic that, that you saw, I haven't seen it, uh, that was shown during the reveal more than likely will be shown at some later point. I think that the, the positive thing to take away from this is Bungie has front-loaded story. They front-loaded uh, characters that matter. And, and I, I guess grassroots relationships that were they're kind of being fostered from this moment forward. And you can't please everybody all the time, but I think that the direction that they've gone is going to please a lot more people that than, uh, than the people that were initially pleased with Destiny 1. I think it's a positive uh, move that they've made. And to me, the characters and the story and the plot that I've seen so far have been a great move forward compared to what we've had in the past. Well, like, I could totally like see it from Gary's perspective totally because like what I was expecting and what I got were two completely different things but at the end I was still extremely happy with it so like whereas in like Destiny 1 it had story there was just no directive to the story we didn't know why we were doing these things mm -hmm. you know what I mean like now we know why we're doing it and we're interacting with the Vanguard and I felt like that there was some character development. Like, Zavala was definitely going through some issues, and towards the end, you know, like, obviously, like, it, it's no spoiler that, like, you have to rally the troops. You gotta, you gotta re-inspire everyone. You know, everyone's at their... We're coming off this ultimate high of the Age of Triumph, where we have beat everything that stepped in our path. And we are at the the pinnacle. We're, we're on the verge of another Golden Age. You know what I mean? And you know, all of this happens, and now all of a sudden, we're at an ultimate low. You know, the lowest we've ever been. And, you know, it's our job to rally and inspire everyone else to show, like, hey, man, we're not just going to roll over and die. And you could definitely see some of the character development. However, at the reveal, when they had kind of spoken that you're going to have to go find Cade, Akora, and Zavala, and stuff like that, I'm not going to say that there wasn't enough story, but I figured there was going to be, like, I felt like we did a lot of stuff for Zavala, you know, we did a thing or two for Cade, and then, like, we did something for Ike. It, just, it did kind of feel a little rushed there. I wish they kind of would have, we would have had a little bit more things to do to inspire them or help them get to the point of, um, I, I guess, just a believer at that point, like, that, you know, we can do this. And... So, like, I, I do kind of see what Gary was saying a little bit, you know, when they were kind of showing us, like, hey, you're going to have to go find them and rally them. I was thinking, you know, that we were going to have to be, you know, going doing through some, some quests, things, yeah. Going through more quests with Ikora. Like, I felt like we got a decent, I felt satisfied with the amount of interaction I had with the Zavala. I really did. Yeah, I've um, seen him the most so far, too. Yeah, Cade, I mean, just a, a couple of plot yeah, holes. So I agree. I disagree. I, for me, Ikora was the standout by a long shot. Ikora's really? crisis of confidence was really like the most moving to me because when you, when you first meet her and when you, your final interactions with, with her, like there's really a metamorphosis. I feel like that's happened with her personally. 
Like she has really been changed uh, by this experience. And I, I found that pretty good. Was it a master class? Like, was this like a, you know, uh, something that, it, you know, would win an Oscar from a movie? No, it was a video game and it's done in cutscenes that are 30 seconds to two minutes long. So yeah, it did feel a little rushed. I would agree with you. But I thought it was really well done. When I, when I finished the campaign of Destiny 2, I felt far more connected to Cade 6, Ikora, uh, Hawthorne, uh, you know, everybody than I ever felt in Destiny 1. In Destiny 1, these guys were just people that I went to to collect shit from. Same here. I'm you not know? even done, and I feel a huge connection to these characters. In Destiny 2, like, I can't wait to see how this progresses further now with each of these characters. I have now am invested in these characters, uh, which is a big change for me, and I'm really pleased about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, yeah. you made a good point about Ikora because... You know, even after finishing the campaign, Zavala Zavala again. Cade will always be Cade. You know, and I, I could say that I, I want more Cade, but who doesn't? You know what yeah. I mean? Like you, you could have gave me a three hour quest line with Cade and I would have wanted more. But like you kind of made a good point, Briar. Like when you go and see Ikora afterwards, she's like her demeanor has completely changed. She looks much more sad and like yeah. confused, Thank shaken. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like we just got about gotten, we got lucky. We just about got knocked on our ass. You know what I mean? Like, and it the experiences that she's had, like, I believe she says something around the lines of, I've always wanted to study the greatest mysteries. And now I realize that there's mysteries out there so great that I'll never comprehend them. You know what I mean? And that's like the curse of a warlock. You know what I mean? Rough, like, yeah. it's never enough knowledge. It's never enough. You know, you're always wanting to know more. And I think you made a good point about that. Uh, I just want to just quickly mention a character that I'm quickly falling in love with that's not even a living character in this world. Failsafe uh, is one of the funniest android or AIs I've seen in a long time. For some reason, I always find AIs with comedic tones to be extra funny. And uh, she's this AI has really went in on K6 on numerous occasions. Yeah, she does. Uh, Savage. Really destroying him and and... The funny thing about this AI is that everything she says, she says it in an extremely pleasant tone, even though it's like a very hardcore diss. And, and that kind of comedic humor, I really appreciate. And for me, that character or this AI is one of my favorite standouts so far. It's like the yin to She's the yang. She's got more to give, six. too, Beastly, which is great. After the story, when you're done with like the main campaign... Uh, she's definitely a standout as far as like further continuing story goes. Good. She's got a set of missions where you really feel a connection to her, even though really? she's a machine, even though, you know, she is a, All right. like there is, you really start to feel some sympathy and some connection to her. I did anyway, when I was playing through those missions. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm one of those crazy guys. I fell in love with Edie in the mass effect series, mass effect two. And she was the AI. So maybe I'm just one of those weird characters. But, yeah, I thought that was an, uh, a, a little mentionable thing. Well, BC, you had mentioned that that's quickly becoming your favorite character. It is, like, off the top of your head, guys. I mean, is there anyone that you feel much more closer to in the story or maybe potentially is... Because, I mean, in Destiny 1, Cade 6 was my favorite character. But, like, I still like Cade. But, like, you know, I'm feeling, like BC said, a slight more connection with some of the more people. Like, I thought... Our interactions with Hawthorne were amazing. Hawthorne is awesome. She's she's awesome, yeah. You know, she's just a normal person, you know, and like so it's almost kind of giving you a connection between like the people that weren't touched by the light or blessed with the traveler's light. You know, Hawthorne what I mean? also so, exposes like like a different side of the world of destiny, right? She's not happy with how things were being run in the last city before, you know, all this shit went down. And she she has no problem telling you that. And then when when your when your goals don't align with her goals, she tells you about that too. She 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 really expresses her displeasure in your decisions and your actions, which is you've never heard before. You've been the savior so many times throughout Destiny's history, and to have a character talking to you like, ah, no, this whole thing is not working for me. I well, thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. And then I think you're you're on the money there, um, Briar. Her dialogue around, I think she was talking about the last city. And talking about the towers that surround it and saying, you know, there's another term for a, a place that's got big walls around it that people can't get out of too. 
you know, and the, the ideas of saying, actually, are these people being protected or are they being in captivity? You know, what is it? You know, and I thought those were some really interesting character concepts that not everyone, your your, your guardians are not universally accepted as, as the saviors. I think that was really, really a smart move to have her in there. Right. And then what I hope for Ikora, for Hawthorne, for, for, for everybody is that as we continue along, we start to learn more and we start to see more and we start having more interactions with these characters because that, to me, the relationships that you build, right, that's the interesting part, right? It's not, it's not always just about killing the aliens. It's also about who you kill the aliens with. And uh, I, I found that to be really interesting. But also probably my disappointment, my mo biggest disappointment about the campaign was that you never really feel like you're a part of the vanguard when you're out there fighting, right? Is you have these cutscenes, but you never, right at the beginning, and this is we've played this a ton, right? Every beta's had it. Is you have this moment where you're you're literally fighting elbow to elbow with Zavala, but you never really get that feeling again, right? Like it, it's kind of a unkempt promise to me. Yeah, that would have been really nice to. Um... I don't know, maybe one week, like, Zavala's on in the European dead zone. Or maybe the next week, you know, you can find Ikora out there, you know, dropping Nova bombs on a pack of enemy and then missing <laughs> one in the back corner, like how she does now Did you, it, through the story mode. Uh, it'd be really cool to have a little bit more interaction. I kind of feel you. I kind of felt like the beta set a tone, like, here's just, here's just, like, a little taste of, you know, being alongside Zavala. You know, he pops the bubble and makes the orbs for you and he definitely died for me in my campaign run, popped his bubble, died instantly, <laughs> and I had to resurrect him. Um, I think you were saying, Briar, we noticed today that uh, when Ikora comes down and Nova bombs that pack of Cabal, she misses one now. And you said, how funny would it be if she came in and threw a Nova bomb and it just slammed into the side of the wall and completely <laughs> missed? And then you had to clean them up or, like, hit a little rock right in front of them? Or that would have been great. But, like, yeah, it'd be really cool, like, be on a patrol and you trigger yeah. a certain thing and all of a sudden Cade 6 comes jumping up out of the air and flap, flap, flap with this golden Man, gun awesome and it just kind of helps you out. And They did things in line with their characters, like you say, like, um, like maybe she whiffed an over or like if you die and you're on a mission with Cade, he'll like give you a couple of bags while he's like resing you. I think that'd be <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah that, that'd be great. Like Cade 6, like, <laughs> but you know, just, just like a mission or two with every character where you actually, you know, almost like an escort mission in other games, but not necessarily because obviously the Vanguard would be pretty powerful. Uh, but like, you know, you, you do a mission with these characters and you get like that kind of dialogue that you get over the comms now, but you actually see the character and you, you watch them fight and you, you resurrect them if they go down, like that, that kind of stuff. I thought that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Maybe. I mean... They're taking baby steps towards it, you know, and if we voice that, like, we want more stuff like that. Like, I think Gary nailed it. Like, you're in the middle of a patrol and, like, uh, a cabal knocks you down and your buddies can't get to you. And then all of a sudden, who's this guy? And it's Cade 6 and he just comes and gives you a free res. It doesn't even have to be anything like, like an entire story where he's right by your side. But it would be funny if every now and then you saw, like, a little cameo appearance out in the wild well, or something. And then how about this, Wilson? The same way that they have these public events that are happening all over the place in this game, which I absolutely love because they're so reliable. And, it, you know, the public events in D1 were just so abstract, and you just it, you never knew exactly where to go or when to go. And now no matter what you're doing, where you are, you know exactly what's going on. What if they made public event type of events uh, that allowed the Vanguard to actually come down and help you or to be in a situation where you fought alongside them for a period of time. Would right. that maybe yeah, uh, so soothe so yeah, this that's... appetite where maybe you, you're checking your map and you see that Zavala will be here at this time and when he comes maybe uh, a, a particularly strong enemy or enemies come down and he's there to help you. And you guys, you know, share witty banter back and forth during that period of time. It kind of builds that bond. That would be awesome. And that would be something they could do very easily. Uh, and, and many, love, many people could experience. That's a good idea. I love Sweep's idea here in chat. How cool would it yeah. be if you have, if you and a friend queue up for a strike and the Vanguard joins as the third? Ooh. Tells more dialogue and story. Like, just randomly, kind of, all of a sudden there's a Vanguard on your team. That would be amazing. 
Yeah, it wouldn't cool. happen every time. It's awesome. like a random it, event kind of thing. As long as I could have, I mean, I know he's not part of the Vanguard, but if I could have Lord Shax where he's just punching shit like he was in the trailer, just like going off talking trash. <laughs> that was one of the, I wasn't even at that reveal. Briar, I know you were, so you know more about like the mood in the room. But when they showed, and I know this isn't like in Destiny 2, it's actually in that cutscene that Gary was talking about. Um, when it showed Zavala. Shax and Saladin all fighting together and you could hear everyone yeah. go crazy like it was really cool when he just punched that that dreg that came running at him and it'd be fun to have some of those characters in there like that would obviously require like a whole lot of coding and it would be a lot harder to do than I think Beasley's idea is like don't get me wrong Sweep's idea is awesome but realistically like for now I think they probably could do the public event thing like all like randomly one public event is like Zavala needs your help or yeah, like, or, uh, you know, or Cade Six is is at it again and needs your help or something I like mean, that. You know, another and, way to develop the characters, which I think was a bit of a wasted opportunity, and it's probably a good transition as well to take us onto planet maps, activities, and things you do. Um, the memories is it Ikora's memories that we do, or, uh, meditations. Sorry, meditations, um, where you go back and run a mission again uh, at a higher difficulty. For me, that would be fantastic if that was a way to do character exposition. So rather than being a mission you've already done, it was a rotating three missions each week or one mission each week where you went back and visited a, a memory of one of the vanguards and you were playing as them and you had like an experience they'd had. I don't know. For me, I just I want to know more about those characters. And, and I know Destiny is, is about building your own legend. But for me, I want to explore some of the legends that exist, you know, whether it's in lore or the vanguard themselves. I don't know. I think a lot of that is out there, Gary. I really do. I think, like, at, right now we've been really on this kind of mainline grind, getting raid ready, getting trials ready. Uh, I think once we start exploring the adventures, I think there is actually a lot of that out there. I hope so, man, because there is some fantastic lore in this universe, man. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like, I want to know what's going on now, and I'm very interested in what is currently happening in the universe of Destiny, but... Dude, there are some incredible stories about, you know, how we've even gotten to where we're at, you know, like we didn't even really like touch on the like, you know, with Rise of Iron, like the fact that when we first got touched by the light, we were kind of savages about it. We controlled land like barons and formed clans and, you know, like in the fact that we, it was like going back to the barbaric days all over again. And, you know, somehow we made it like that stuff's really interesting to me and. It'd be really cool the, to visit some of that stuff and maybe like a future meditation or DLC or something. I don't know. For yeah, me, so. uh, something I've really enjoyed is like these little adventures that you do that give you little tidbits of story, yeah. little things on the side. It's almost like the grimoire in, in another form. And correct Very me if I'm wrong. It's like the grimoire. Very yeah. I, now, me in D1, I never ever went online to read any of the grimoire. I just, yeah. I felt like it was something that. Sh was outside of the experience. I felt like it'd be going to the movies to leave that theater and go walk into another theater to find out about that same movie. And so I never took the time out to actually read it, but now it's easily digestible in game in a way that is actually fun. And uh, I think if they continue to do it, like you said, there's so much lore. There's so many amazing things that have been uh, created, crafted around this world. And now it's created in a way that the gamer wants to experience. And, and I don't think I'm alone. I think many people who play Destiny 2 probably never went to the Grimoire and read, you know, all this information and digested it that way. Or maybe I'm one of the few who didn't. But I it, think that doing it the way they're doing it now makes it so much more enjoyable for gamers. The there were a bunch of problems with the grimoire. One of them was obviously it wasn't in the game. You had to go to a website. But another problem with it was it was dense. It was not an easy read. Some of it was very entertaining and very easy to read. Some of it was like you really had to interpret what the fuck you're trying to read here. So, right? yeah, it was the way that they conveyed who was speaking. It yeah. wasn't necessarily like their name semicolon and this is what they said it would be constructed in a very strange way like alpha numeral like this is person 1a this is person 2b or 1b really? and yeah it was really really convoluted. hard to digest very yeah. convoluted however we have an awesome dedicated community um like obviously everyone knows <laughs> Bife, but yeah, i would like Island to uh, 
Yeah, I would like to actually, they don't really do them anymore, but like, I know it's not Destiny 2 related, it's Destiny 1, but the audio grimoire by Ghost and Echoes is what really got me into this universe. Not only do they, it's not just like reading an audio book, whether it's it's monotone, you know, they actually do voice acting with it, and there's no reading, none of this 1A, 1B, 2C, person, 3, 4 bullshit. You actually hear these conversations going on, and they're very immersive. They're very, very good. Um, the stuff how they, they did, did it, for the last word in Thorn was outstanding. Moving, moving goosebumps. Like, yeah. I got chills. Like, I, I almost getting chills just thinking about it. With that said, I am glad that it's more in-game this time. I yeah. would like a little extra on the side. Like, I don't think that you can ever have too much lore. Like, mm -hmm. maybe in-game you can have too much lore. But if there's people out there that, that want more, I mean, what's wrong with a couple extra little sprinkles that if you're that dedicated and want to know totally that agree. go somewhere else? But I think they nailed it. I think there was a very healthy mix of uh, lore and all that stuff. But, but I mean, Bungie gets um, a, a hell of a lot of flack for the Grimoire. And I'm probably one of the, the few proponents that defend the Grimoire. Not that I think it was um, a smart move or a user-friendly experience, not by a long shot. But this was not designed uh, by accident. You know, this was not an, an engineered through any sort of uh, circumstance. These were, Bungie had already said, you know, these were these, these were dedicated writers that were pulled together. And the, the, the pieces were written in such a way as that they felt like you were pouring over historical documents and resources and trying to rebuild a story that was that was pieced together. You know, Bungie could have told us a really linear story and history, but instead they told history from, um, I guess, unreliable narrators from different perspectives and different journeys. So again, if, if you were that way inclined, someone like Mylin or Bife who went in and did the, the law reading to it to piece it all together, there was a wealth of information there. Was it the right way to convey that information? Potentially not, but I don't I think, think it it's was, fair to say it was I think convoluted. it was an emergency way to convey that information is they – they blew that story up a year before that game was released, and they needed to figure out a way to get some kind of story in Destiny, and that's where the grimoire came from. That makes perfect sense, Briar. Public outcry created that need for the emergency of, of a story, and it seems like a, a necessity at that time. So, so we, we talk a little bit about like exploring grimoire. Um, how did you guys feel about like exploring some of the plants and stuff? What were, what were some of the awesome. feelings when you when you touch it down? Like, you know, like I'm, I'm not gonna lie, getting into the European dead zone, I was like, okay, this is a little confined. This is a little cosmodromish. You know what I mean? It looks like it could be vast, but it's not. But man, once you start getting into some other planets, I started feeling really small and getting lost a lot. You know, like, and I don't mean like lost, like. Oh, I'm off doing this shit. I mean, lost like where the hell am I and where the hell do I need to go? Like, it felt pretty vast. Like, there was definitely moments where I was like, "This is almost this is too much." Like, it's yeah. it's so overwhelming. Like, there's so much to look at, things to scan, things to do. How'd you guys feel about that? I, I, I felt exactly the same. Get way. that? Uh, I, I didn't get that claustrophobic feeling from the European Dead Zone. When I first landed in the European Dead Zone, I felt like, "Oh my god, this is way bigger." Than anything we've seen in Destiny One, like it, it just felt bigger, um, more densely packed, like not just graphically, but also with events, like public events, with with missions, with lost sectors, with with all sorts of activities, and you know, even chests, and just it felt like wherever I was, there was something going on, something to find, and I think that's one of the reasons it was a good idea not to have us just flying through on sparrows from the get-go is because when you're on foot i was joking around a couple of days ago that i felt like this is like the first few missions are like an add person's like worst nightmare because you're like go, trying to get from point a to point b and you get distracted yeah. like six times 50 on the way you almost forget what your original goal was like oh here's a lost sector oh here's an activity oh here's like a world it's boss that i could defeat and get some loot yeah, it's still happening. Uh, we were playing earlier. Remember, we were trying to do our uh, our daily milestone for complete the challenges in the EDZ. Yeah. And remember, we were like, well, "Should we go here and start new? Well, should we start a new character? Should we <laughs> should, should we jump in to, to this planet or, or no? Let's just finish out these challenges so we can get our you know our reputation coins." And right. uh, 
it still happens. Uh, the whole claustrophobic thing really stems from, I should have elaborated on that a little more. Like the first area you load into is a little claustrophobic, but then yeah, sure. once you branch out and kind of go, it definitely opens up. I would agree for sure. I've so, been kind of taken aback by uh, the vastness of these planets, honestly. Uh, what I've seen so far, I haven't really been to any of the same places twice unless I was ab absolutely trying to get back to the same place. You can go off and go and go and go. And um, to me, that's a big deal, especially in a game like this. Seeing what we saw in Destiny 1, it's really exciting to know this is the vanilla version of Destiny 2. You know, because you know what's going to be coming down the road. And with this much content initially, uh, I think that that bodes very well for the future of Destiny 2. I, I mean, like you, uh, Wilson, I'd gotten off and, and, and walked off and left my wife behind. And I'd be, you know, 500 yards in another direction, fighting a whole new group of enemies for no reason, finding chests. And like Briar said, it's something to do everywhere you go. There's a public event around every corner. And they're very reliable. You don't have to look for them anymore. It's just so much more to do, and uh, I'm really excited about the future of this game. So, in terms of the new activities that we have, um, I kind of reflected back on what we had in Destiny 1, and we haven't really got that much more, but what we do have is accessibility to it. So, do you think that that's the difference in that, okay, if we, if we t cast our mind back to Destiny 1, mm -hmm. the adventures are side missions. That's what they were called in Destiny 1. You had your story missions, then you had side missions on a planet you had the patrol zone and then side missions the public events were there you just had to go to a separate website to find out when they were spawning rather than having it on the map mm -hmm. we have a map that's obviously a, a big change there um, and then patrols patrols are patrols that they've, they've always been They're there direct directly the same yeah lift lift and drag the yeah. high value targets were previously just random spawn difficult to find but they're there so really if we think about it we're not playing much different. It's still the Destiny 1 content, but perspective and delivery seem to make the big difference here. What do you guys think? I agree, 100%. I, I, I agree, and I disagree. I mean, like, you could look at bounties from Destiny 1 are now just kind of, they're in your director, right? Is if you bring up, if you press menu, you can basically see the, the bounties for the place you're in. Uh, you can even see them in the director for you know, the whole game, and you can see the loot that you're going to get from doing your bounties. It's just, you know, it's a different system, but it's doing this basically the same thing. But activities to me are not the side missions. I mean, they are theoretically, but the side missions in Destiny 1, what did we get, 30 total missions? Less than that, right, for Destiny 1? There's so many more of them. There's so much more to Destiny 2. Like, how many missions are there in just the main campaign? A lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a fair a amount. Lot more. There's got to be, what, like 16, 17? I think I, it's an expanded one, but I think it's within the same realm. If we went back and added up all the planets, including, you know, I, I guess you could look at Vanilla and forget the Dreadnought and forget House of Wolves, etc. But we, we did have a lot of side missions by the end of the game. The, yeah, like, you can the, give the me... side a, missions were... I don't know, man. The adventures seemed much... I see where you're saying. Like, there is definitely a relation between the two. But the side mm -hmm. missions, it feels so much richer than anything we saw. Or, I'm sorry, the... Adventures. The adventures feel so much richer than anything we saw from a, you know, a side mission in Destiny 1. They, they have story to them. They have, you know, cool locations. Like, I don't know. They just feel much richer than anything we saw. They, they might maybe, be more maybe stale. Maybe right, had... it's just that they amped, up the, amped it up a little bit. Yeah, I mean... I, I got to agree with Gary here. I mean, maybe if we had Peter Dinklage talk us through the adventures in Destiny 2, it wouldn't be quite as exciting. But uh, for me, it does. There are a lot of parallels, Briar. If you look at, you know, after a few DLCs of Destiny 1, side missions versus adventures, it really was very similar type of activities. Uh, the presentation is a little bit different. You do feel like it's more centered around an actual story, part of the past lore. And Destiny 2, but overall it is very similar type of activities. But the thing that makes it feel different is the accessibility. The fact that it's right there at the touch of a button. that You can find out exactly what you need to do, where you need to go, versus looking around and going to a certain place and waiting for an event. You you remember that feeling. You know, you go waiting for a public event and you sit there and you wait for 
10, 15 minutes because this is exactly what you need. Now the accessibility is or four you just hours, go. You know, whatever. Yeah, you, you just you know, <laughs> you, tap, you you open up your map. You know when it's going to start. You can go there, and the accessibility is what makes a huge difference to me. So that's why I, I got to agree with uh, Mr. Diaz there. I think you nailed it. I think it's the presentation of what you're doing. Like, yeah, we're doing a lot of um, the same patrols and public events are, they're different, but like, ultimately it's the same thing. You know, they pop in a certain area with an activity, but it's the presentation of it and how they're presented. Like you can give me, you can give me a hundred different missions to do on a planet. If there's no context to them or something that's not interesting enough, like I, I don't care. I'm not going to want to do it. Like, it's not like, yes, it's always about the loot. We, we do all this stuff for the loot, but sometimes we also do it for the story and the immersion. You know what I mean? Like, and I definitely feel like I'm getting that with these. Like, I feel like there's a reason that I need to do this public event. Why was I stopping the extraction crew in D1? What were they extracting? Why were they there? You know, D2, they're extracting glimmer. I want that glimmer. That's not theirs. You know what I mean? So now I want to do a heroic version of it. You'd get that glimmer. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's another thing too, man, is the, um, not only just to knock out a public event, but to trigger a heroic one and to see some of the things that happen when you do trigger the heroic one. Like I remember triggering the first heroic public event and, uh, it was the uh, devil walker. And it blew my mind when we triggered the heroic and the second one crashed down and I actually slammed on my one of my fire team members, Con Man. The first one that came down killed him. We got up, took it out, <laughs> triggered the heroic vent, had no idea that the second one was coming in and just boom right on him. And it was glorious. We're gonna remember that forever. Like, hey, remember the time you got dunked on by both walker tanks? Like, you know, and creating those stories and like it kind of goes back to the beginning when um you see all the stuff you've completed things uh, with like all the activities you completed with people. Uh, Holtzman had touched that. He was excited that the people that he had finished a lot of those activities with were in his party at that time. And it was the same thing for me, great and Conley. And the fact that we were getting ready to bounce back out there and, and make those new memories, like getting dunked on by Walker tanks is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I only asked the the question because I kind of call him back to Luke Smith in a, pre-release interview and i think luke's direction for the game and what he was trying to deliver on was i think the term was unhiding the fun so he said destiny one had a whole heap of fun and we've we've evidenced that by playing it for this many hours but you had to find that fun it wasn't immediately accessible destiny 2 definitely done a job of taking that fun and making it easy to find Uh, so i think we're all agreed there and you mentioned as well uh, wilson that we do it for the loot you know as well as the grind the loot Probably good time to talk about the loot. We haven't mentioned it at all. Guns and armor. Uh, there was the promise that this time we'd move into a world where there'd be distinct guns and weapons, things that kind of felt exotic, felt unique, felt rare. How do we feel about it? Do we feel like we've we're still just equipping, uh, you know, a different different skin, or do we feel now that these guns have character and personality? This one, I feel like this one's hard to talk about right now because I haven't so spent enough time with it. Like right now, I'm very enamored with every new weapon that I find, with every new piece of armor that I find. I'm very enamored because I just opened up uh, being able to modify my armor uh, with legendary modifications, which really does change the way, or seems to change the way uh, that you can build out a guardian. Like it, in major ways, you could build out a guardian for uh, increased. Uh, increased recharges to your grenades. You can build them out to have faster reload speed or uh, more stability on kinetic weapons. You know, like really, however you want to specialize this Guardian, you can build, not only can you, you know, change your subclass, but you can actually change your armor and change your weapons to reflect how you like to play. How effective that is, I can't speak to you right now because I literally just unlocked it and I literally... You know, I just haven't had enough time, but it's promising. It's definitely promising. Well, well from what, an end what? game perspective, we don't know yet. Like yeah. from an end game perspective, from but from a first impression standpoint, I will say the majority of the exotics that I've gotten weapons feel exotic. That's an armor. Nice <laughs> armor, yeah. And I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's 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 a couple in there that That's... you know, 
Yeah, there's a couple duds in there. Um, but maybe, you know, they have a good perk on them, but it's not quite exotic, you know what I mean? Um, but I feel like some of the armor, like there's a few armor pieces that are definitely like one in particular for the hunters that are broken a little bit. Um, <laughs> but some of them feel pretty, the armor feels pretty lackluster. Um, there are some good utilities, like um, things like uh, faster melee uh, ability recharge rate, like when your super's active, or even just in general, like you have a quicker um, refresh rate of your abilities. Um, the legendaries, I think, I think you made a good point of I'm infatuated with every legendary that I get now because I just don't know, you know what I mean? And if it's not something that I see an immediate use for, it's going into the vault until somebody like Holtzman uh, figures out that it's OP as shit and puts out a review on it and lets everyone know, you know, but it's that infatuation of like your first legendary, you know what I mean? Like in the game, like mine was a, uh, a scout rifle, you know, and uh, it, I love that scout rifle. It's awesome. It might not even be that good because I've only had that, you know, maybe that and one other scout rifle, but uh, right now, like they weren't lying when they said there'd be a ton of loot. Yeah, like I'm getting a shitload of loot. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Like, if you guys are getting a lot of loot too, or yeah, it's it's raining down like crazy. It's like, raining. It really loot. is. It makes me worry in a month if I'm still gonna be get getting excited. You know, like I, I just don't know. Like that's why it's so hard to talk about this subject right now because in a month I think we'll have a very clear idea. Like how much loot is there? How good are all the weapons? How different do the weapons feel? Um, are there weapons that are just going to be go-to weapons? Like, are you just going to be playing with the better devils and, you know, the the mini Mida and a fusion rifle for the next three months until they do a balance patch? Or is there is there variety there? Is there separate metas? Or is it just going to be the same as Destiny 2? There's only think, better well, devils. There's only better devils, Briar. <laughs> I got one, by the way. For those in chat who know I've been going after one, I got one last night. My damn near two long day quest is over. <laughs> you finally got some sleep. You slept today, right before the show. Only took me two days. Poor thing, right? You know, what, what I was going for with the question was more around Destiny 1 had a certain feel to it, um, whether it's a bungee shooter feel or not. There was a certain um, kinesthesia to pull in the, the R2 trigger and the gun doing something on screen, there was a real weight to the feel of the guns. I'm just kind of getting at, you know, do we do we feel that these guns are, um, the gunplay, is it is it up there with Destiny 1 gunplay? Does, does a pulse still feel like a pulse? Does a hand cannon still perform like a hand cannon? Are you impressed with these? Is it better? Is it worse? What's the sound design like? Like, is there still that euphoria of, of just playing the game and shooting these guns? That's something I, I can speak to. I think that it feels just as good, if not better, than the original game, uh, what I've played with so far. I've noticed that certain classes of weapons have been completely removed. Why do we have no heavy machine guns anymore? Why yeah, it's do called those the not sweet exist? business. An exotic oh, primary. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> it is pretty sweet. Is it an exotic business. primary? Yeah. It's, it yeah, exists? It's a, it's a minigun. Yeah. It was a, you played the beta, right? You played a Titan. Yeah. Yeah, that no, exotic that you got. I didn't, that big... play, I didn't play as a Titan. I'm sorry. That's no. your first problem. Warlock for life. Hunters. Is... Nope. Hunters. I changed my mind. I'm not a warlock anymore. I'm a hunter. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> what I, what like, I the, the sweet Gary... business definitely feels like a heavy MG. Briar nailed it. That's the closest okay. thing you're going to get. Okay. <laughs> well, what, what I play with hand cannons, uh, scout rifles, uh, pulse rifles, fusions are, of course, over fucking power. That's my go to now for anything that's dangerous. Uh, but yeah, it, it does feel. Uh, just as good, if not better, than the original game for me. That, that, that's one thing I think Destiny nailed more so than any other game. Uh, that's a first-person shooter at 30 frames per second. The gunplay just felt so visceral. And uh, I think Destiny 2 has it in droves as well. Do you guys not agree? Do you, do you think that maybe Destiny 2's gunplay doesn't hold up to Destiny 1's? Feels I'm different unsure about it right now. Yeah, I'm unsure. I'm on the fence because something about it feels a little different. But it's still enjoyable. Like uh, Gary had touched on the sound. Like when I shoot a gun, like sometimes I'm like, ooh, did you hear that? You know what I mean? Like that, <laughs> that, that made a noise. You know what I mean? Like it made a really cool noise. And cool. Um, it some of the weapons definitely still do have that um, sword I'm looking for. Charm to them when, when you fire it, you know, it, it just feels good. Um, 
Better Devils is definitely one of those. Uh, it's my favorite legendary in the game right now. Um, Damn, I want to see that. De- definitely feels really good. It's a Crucible hand cannon. Uh, grind it out in the Crucible if you want to get one. But um, it definitely feels different. And I'm kind of with Briar where it's, it might be a little too early to say. I will definitely say hand cannons feel different. Um, That's Briar the one had, thing. Briar had touched on pulse rifles when we were playing earlier. He says that they feel a little too... Like, they bounce a little bit between shots a little bit too much. Yeah, so uh, there's definitely some differences. Maybe they're for the better. Maybe we just need to get used to them because we're coming off a three-year-long um, yeah. let, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, hand cannons were my go-to in Destiny 1. Uh, I got very comfortable using them and, and actually got really good with it. Uh, early in Destiny 2, I, I tried a few hand cannons, and they did feel a little bit different, so I kind of drifted away from it. It felt very loose to me uh, compared to Destiny hey, 1. Good, Is that what you're talking about? It it just seemed word. to move <laughs> much faster, just be very, very loose. So I've gone to auto rifles and, and, and things of that nature and kind of shied away from it, thinking maybe I haven't played in a long time. So you might, you're probably right if that's the case. It just felt very loose when I was playing with hand cannons. Can we talk about auto rifles for a second and how awesome they feel? Do you guys auto feel that way? Shit, yeah. They are. The, They're amazing. There's something about the aiming, though, right now. Uh, and I haven't played the Xbox version, so this might just be a PlayStation thing that feels different. It's not a ton different than Destiny 1, but definitely it's different, right? I feel like... You know, hitting those precision shots just takes a little more time, a little more mm-hmm. effort than it does in Destiny One. Maybe it's aim assist, maybe it's bullet magnetism. I don't know. I think I bet we'll find out sooner rather than later, like when we really like kind of start slowing down some footage and looking at it. But what's really weird is that we noticed this during the beta, the console beta, and then we played the PC beta, and a lot of us played with controllers. And it seemed to have gone back to the way it felt in Destiny 1, right? It's like the the handling of weapons felt very much like Destiny 1 in the PC beta. And it made me think, well, they must have, they must have changed it to be a little less precise in the console beta. Seeing that, you know, they didn't like it, and then they kind of reversed that decision for the PC beta. So when I started playing the full release of Destiny 2, I kind of expected it to feel more like the PC beta than the console beta. But I was mistaken. It still feels like that console beta. And I'm not sure I'm complaining, to be honest. It, difference, the difference is noticeable. I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad difference. You know what I mean? Like, having to take a little more time to hit a precision shot, in the end, may be a good thing. I, I don't know at this point. But it definitely feels different. <laughs> Gary, I know you had some thoughts on the, how the weapons felt different. Yeah, so I'm come coming at it from a pretty unique perspective because I'm a filthy Zim 4 cheater, um, which means I, I actually play <laughs> Destiny. Big Zim. I play, I play Destiny 2. Big Zim. Um, and I play Destiny 1 on keyboard and mouse using a, an adapter. So uh, effectively, my my controller is rooted through a keyboard and mouse so I can use that it doesn't give me any um, I'm not able to do anything a controller can't but it just gives me my preferred method of input so I've played destiny one like that um, and I've now played destiny two like that and for me um, I have no trouble being precise with the shots because I'm using a mouse and it's not because I'm a great player but a mouse is just easier to aim with than a thumbstick um, that that's kind of just objective fact I can be on a target um, a a relatively close range, we're not talking extended ranges, shoot the shot and it will either not hit the precision shot, even though I'm clearly on the target's head, this is in PvE as well as PvP, um, or it will just miss altogether, which I don't know whether or not it's you guys, you know, your aiming or your aim assistance or whether or not there is... um, a percentile of bloom or a percentile of variance in the the, the shot. There's no doubt. Like there is definitely bloom. It, it. That's another thing that feels different than the, the PC beta. I don't want to like compare like which version of the game is better or worse. It just felt it feels different, right? And it feels different from Destiny One. And when a, I believe that when a, 
when an aiming reticle is on an enemy's head, that's where the bullet should go. Yeah. Like, that's how I feel about it. Like Whether you're in the air or dodging or anything, if you point a bullet at something, it's going to go there. That's how it should be, right? So whenever a bullet misses that I feel like should have hit because my I was, you know, I had done everything I was supposed to do, like I feel cheated. So Bloom is just a bad idea. It's a bad mechanic, and it should have never been added. Do you think it's also a combination of um, net code connections and thirty frames? I'm not like I said. Uh, I'm not trying to shit um, on console. I'm just trying I, to be a. I you know. personally don't don't feel that because I get the same in PVE and PVP. Um, I'd also played in, intentionally dropped my monitor resolution down to thirty hertz on the PC version to get a feel for what this is going to look like on on a console um, moving into it because I only played about five hours of the PC beta. Um, but but intentionally tried that, and it still felt nothing like what we've got now, even at 30 hertz, which is a 30 frames per second forced resolution. So in my perspective, no, I don't think it's net code because I get it in PVE when I'm shooting dregs, um, and I don't think it's 30 frames. I think the 30 frames is fantastic. It feels great to play. It feels smooth. Um, I've, I've not had I'm – a, I'm a frame snob. You guys probably know. Um, and I've had no issues playing Destiny at 30 frames per second. I, I prefer it, obviously, at more frames. But I don't feel like Destiny 1 felt choppy. It felt juddery. The aim was great, but the frame rate wasn't so great. This 30 feels smooth. Much I don't smoother. Feel, I think motion blur is used far more heavily in Destiny 2 than it was in Destiny 1. That's something I've noticed to make the, the turns feel smoother. Um, you also mentioned familiarity, though. One thing that I have found is the MIDA multi-tool, spoilers, I guess, <laughs> too late now, uh, if you don't know it's back, but the, the MIDA is back. Um, the MIDA is back with high caliber rounds, and the MIDA feels almost identical to how the MIDA felt in Destiny 1. I've felt no difference in it whatsoever. It feels yeah. exactly the same. The bullet magnetism still there with 100 aim assist stat, I'd imagine. Um, what do you guys feel? Do you feel any difference in the MIDA as the MIDA escaped this change? No, it feels it feels the same. You're right. You're absolutely right. So maybe this is a weapon to weapon difference, or a or a, maybe a class of weapon to class of weapon difference. So I, I feel I definitely feel it more in hand cannons than any other weapon. Right when I'm using a hand cannon, I just feel less precise than I did in Destiny One. I feel like I got to work for that precision shot much harder than I did in Destiny One or the console beta or the I'm sorry or the PC beta. That that might be the change that Bungie was going for, Briar. Maybe it the, the be, weapons right? it could are be a actually that thing. different. Yeah, the, each one could be that different. That something as, I guess, what we would consider normal as aim assist is changed per weapon. It's a possibility. It sounds like it, it, it might actually be happening. Well, can we talk about, like, flinch for a second? Because it's definitely just not on snipers anymore dude i'm getting flinched out of my primary shots in some engagements not just mm -hmm. pve but in pvp as well um it the flinch and like sweep i kind of said it too Mita feels the same but the lens flinch is there more than ever and there's definitely some my point being there's definitely a lot of familiarities with the weapons how they feel how they play um, but there's also some unfamiliar stuff that's going on, like um, sniper recoil. Um, most of the time, it was either straight up or straight up to the right, straight up to the left, you know, a little bit. I'm noticing now sometimes when my sniper rifle reticle is coming back down, it will do like a quarter moon. It'll start to make like a quarter moon. It'll almost kind of, almost like do a circle and go back down. And I think it's just going to take some time to getting to get used to, yeah. you know what I mean? And who knows, maybe this is what they thought was a good solution. And it's up to us as a community to voice if like we, we are, or aren't liking, you know, some of the changes and stuff, but dude, I mean like there's snipers and this isn't me just being a sniper fanboy. You guys know, I love to snipe. I never shut up about it. it it's awesome. It hits every pleasure zone, but like <laughs> something needs to be done with them because like, Fusions are amazing, and that's awesome. Keep them the way they are. Shotguns feel good. Um, grenade launchers, I mean, they feel good in PvE, but, you know, in PvP, that might be a tough balance. But there's really not, unless you're just a sniper fanboy like myself, and I think um, Gary had touched on it yesterday, 
I just like the fantasy of the sniper. You know, it's clearly not the most effective thing right now. Like, I think, like, they're at their ultimate low. I feel like a lot of these power weapons got our year one versions, Destiny 1 unnerfed versions of themselves, except the sniper. Mm. Like, and I get it. You're across the map. You know, there has to be some flinch. I'm not saying get rid of it, but but something feels really off about snipers for me. And I, I'm getting better at them. I'm learning. There's a different learning curve. I'm not expecting to pick up a new game and, you know, triple down after triple down. You know, I'm definitely getting some good shots. I'm being effective with it. But sometimes I'm just like, you know, this isn't the right place or the right time to, to use a sniper. I might as well just pull out a fusion or a shotgun or something. Like I think my critique on snipers was, was not so much PvP, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a couple of topics time. But for me, it's the PvE throughput. So all other power weapons are absolute workhorses in PvE. And even at long range in PvE, the sniper's still nowhere near the throughput of a linear fusion. Um, you know, the, the amount of ammo that you hold and the magazine sizes are so limited. You know, even outlaw snipers are still difficult to be able to maintain that DPS from the amount of power ammo that you have on them. So like I was saying to, to Wilson, you almost want the weapon archetype, all snipers, to have an intrinsic triple tap or something into them. So that if you're shooting a PvE boss with multiple... Uh, consecutive precision shots you at least can maybe extend the mag by two or three bullets something to extend the throughput because sweep said it well in the chat snipers are a bit of a detriment in pve at the moment and granted we've not seen the raid so it may be different but... I, I will oh, say the darcy, the darcy exotic sniper rifle feels awesome that thing is like you talk about like magnetism and aim assist this i can literally point that gun down an alley and if something runs in front of it dude i'll watch my <laughs> it just gets pulled my right ship, along my just fall away right and i was we were cracking up last night we got done doing uh pvp and jumped into some strikes and uh we did a we got to the boss and i was it's a seven shot mag and you can literally pop 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 that fast and it's so sticky that you just have to pull the trigger when that reticle is coming back down and it'll find its way right back to where it was before. It's a really Yeah, what's the name good, of that? It's called the Darcy. It's an exotic sniper rifle. And that's that's cool. I was kind of worried. I was like, oh, great, an exotic sniper rifle. This is cool. But, like, snipers don't feel the same that they did. This one feels really good. And I kind of feel like that's the reason it's exotic is because it has so much aim assist. So, like, I see where they're coming from. Like, dude, it's a sniper rifle. Like, if there was no flinch, there would be no reason to use anything else. There'd just be people on the other side of the map. But I feel like something needs to happen. I think start small, like Gary said, like maybe some intrinsic perks. Maybe uh, maybe a mulligan that only has a 10% chance to proc, something small. You know what I mean? Because I'm definitely missing a lot of shots in PvP due to the ridiculous amount of flinch. Like, it is... The worst it's ever been. Wow. So keeping uh, on the topic of PvE, unless, sorry, Brad, do you want to comment yeah, on Yeah, I was going to actually uh, try and bring up a little PvP. Um, what do you guys think about the maps? What do you guys think about the uh, basically the two playlists? You, you, it's kind of weird going into PvP and not being able to choose your game mode. You know, as a Destiny player, going into Destiny 2 and seeing, okay, we got quick play and, and we got competitive play. But I'm really just in the mood to play, you know, control. control. Or I'm really just in the mood to play like a specific game mode. You don't get that opportunity anymore. You have to kind of just deal with the luck of the draw. What do you guys think about that? I don't like that. Uh, I, I'm a guy who I like my modes. And whenever I played any Crucible, it was always control. That's the mode I, I always like. And to have that, I mean, I guess you win some and you lose some. We were talking about how things are more accessible in Destiny 2. To lose that accessibility is a little frustrating, but I'm thinking at some point in the future, it'll change. I couldn't imagine them uh, just going forward with this, you know, this quick playlist without giving you the ability to play capture the flag or uh, control the way that most people who play Destiny Crucible like to do. I, I see where like people are coming from with this complaint. Sometimes you just want to jump in and play some control. Um, sometimes you want to jump in and say play supremacy. I don't know why you would want to, but some people want to, you know, some people enjoy it, you know. Um, however, like, I feel like that's a good solution, but brings up a completely different set of problems. And one of the main problems being is a split community. Yeah, sure, you've got 
a million active users, but if half of them are in control, you know, or, you know, like half of them are doing this, if there's a vast majority playing a playlist, it splits the community. And I think that's like a huge problem they ran into in Destiny 1 when they're like, you can do uh, Rumble, you could do Year 1 Rumble, you could do Year 1 this, you could do, you know, you know, play whatever you want. And yeah, there was a lot of people playing but there wasn't always a lot of people queuing up for the same type of match that you wanted to. And right now, I'm sure that's fine because this is the ultimate high, one of the ultimate highs that we're going to have as far as player volume goes. I think they said it was something like 1.5 million active people or something stupid like this weekend. It was a huge wow. number. Huge number. And that's, you know, that's on launch day. You know, it's always going to be like that. The iron is hot right now and everyone's striking it. So two months from now or right before the next DLC drop, there's not going to be that many people playing. There's still going to be a lot of people playing, but God forbid we enter a content drought. You're going to be happy that everybody is forced to do either quick play or competitive because you're going to be bitching about matchmaking times. You're going to be bitching about skill-based matchmaking and that every game is always a sweat fest. You know, and that's just that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, listening to it that way, I, I, if that's the reason why, I can 100% understand why Bungie would uh, bring the audience together versus having five or six different places for people to go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, I th the problem is, right, is that some of the game modes I just don't like. <laughs> so when I see them come up, really feel. I'm just going to quit out. And <laughs> that means that I'm leaving behind a three-man team to go fight a four-man team. And I'm not going to feel bad about it because I just don't want to play that <laughs> game mode. I'm sorry. I don't want to play it. And, you know, if it if it was its own playlist, it was just I wouldn't go in there and play it. And I'm not saying that other people don't get to play it. But I just don't like it. I really like, you know, I I like some of the, some of the Crucible modes. And other ones I find to be a little on the tedious side. Well, it's already happening. Uh, last night we jumped into a game and there was a team of three that thought they were going to get all super sweaty and they didn't realize that we were just, just a tiny bit more sweaty. We had already been sweating. There was perspiration that had already been uh, flowing from the previous right guard game. pre -applied. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as we're, yeah, you know, looking for that right guard sponsorship, you know, yeah. but uh, we, uh, we were ready to go. We were amped up, you know, so we're like, all right, they want to play sweaty. Let's do it. And we did. And the team of three left and it was in a competitive survival mode and they left one guy there to fend <laughs> against four of us. And I'm oh. sorry, uh, bad for life 32. He sent me a message after the game saying, sorry, I'm, I'm really bad at this game. And to which I had to tell him your team left you because they didn't yeah. want to play this game mode or they didn't want to play, you know, they thought they got mad cause they weren't winning and they backed out. It's not your fault. So bad for life. You're not bad. It just sucks that your team left you. And, uh, awesome. I mean, it's already happening. You know, people are, they don't, whether they like the game or not, or whether they're winning or losing, they'll leave. Like, it's, it's just unfortunate. I think there Wilson, might need to be a penalty that for that. the incorrect answer. What you should have gone back with was a nice message saying, get fucked, noob. And yes. that was it. Just, just leave it there. Is, of course. Is there a way to draw, like, an emoji for tea bags? Oh, <laughs> um, I, you could always use Crafty's emote. He's got a bag emote, I go. think. There you go. Yeah, savage. You see that. Gary but, is savage. <laughs> Gary is savage. He told me earlier, he's like, that's why I play games is for the salt. That's how he said it. <laughs> yeah. But how do you I feel about that, Brian? I obviously, I kid. What, what if what Wilson just proposed becomes a reality and uh, Bungie enacts penalties for people like yourself who back out of game modes that you don't like? Then they're just... they're. They're reducing my desire to play the Crucible. Yeah. Just go Great. play PvE until your timer's up and then jump back in and... Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know like. what to say. You know, like, I have I feel like I've lost a lot in the Crucible. Uh, my favorite game mode is gone. Rumble was my favorite game mode. Right? I like to... I know that everybody says, how can you chill out in Rumble? That was where I did chill out. I'd go in there. I didn't have <laughs> That's to worry. Hardcore. I didn't have to worry about teammates... Like anything I saw, I tried to kill, and to me, that's that's a load of fun. Actually, is I you know I don't I'm not so competitive that I have to win every match to feel good about myself. I just like to go in there and shoot shit. And other guardians, you know, it was fun. 
the losing Rumble, it was a blow for me. I didn't like that at all. And now I can't even select what I do want to do, right? I can't select it at all. The differences between the competitive and the quick play playlist m game modes, they're not so distinct to me that, you know, I really have a preference over one or the other. You know, if I want to play some control, then I can join the quick play and just kind of wait till it comes up. But maybe I play, maybe I play a couple of games of Clash and I don't really like Clash in Destiny. T in Destiny so... You know, I have to play a couple of games of Clash just to get to what I do like. I don't know. I, I don't like it. And I see what mm. the problem is. Too many playlists separates the community. But too few lo lowers my incentive to play the Crucible at all. Oh, so you're I'm, really in a, in, a, in a tough spot right now, Briar. I'm a PvP guy. So I mentioned it earlier to yourselves. I play PvE exclusively to get me in a position that I can then move into PvP and not be a detriment, and then that's all I'll play. So Destiny 1, 80% of my hours, if not more, were Crucible hours. That was it. That's all I played. 2,000 hours, about 80% of them were, were Crucible. The state of the Crucible at the moment, um, how, it, how it's been implemented, what we've got, the maps that we have, the 4v4 only game modes, it, I am... I don't find much incentive for me to go into it and play it for an extended period of time, which is sad. Um, the loot pool is limited in Crucible in comparison with what I can get from PvE, more broad brush. Um, there's obviously there's no ranking system. There's no private matches. Um, there's no seasons. And my, my second point on this is that I feel like we have not had the PvP system of Destiny 2 implemented yet. I feel like what we've got here is a placeholder or a pilot for what they're going to have. And I feel like the osiris dlc which is now confirmed to be coming in um december and the trials of osiris which is or trials of the nine whatever it is which is starting this weekend is going to be introducing the full fat pvp experience so i feel at the moment yes completely agree with you brian the pvp is um bare bones you know play it if you're absolutely crazy about it but really it's i don't think it's been launched yet i feel it's a soft you, launch you think PvP. you think uh that the PVP will be available this weekend, their full-fledged version? It is. It's confirmed. Trials uh, of the Nine starts on, was it Friday? So, all right, ah. so this is a little confusing, Beastly. Trials of the Nine is the, the game mode that is kind of like a replacement for Trials of Osiris that was in Destiny 1. Mm -hmm. But there's also an Osiris DLC coming in December. So it's, it's a little like this. It's confusing if you're like looking at this from the search from the surface and you're not ultra familiar with the with the context of everything. So when we when we go in next weekend, we'll be playing Trials of the Nine, which is like Trials of Osiris but a different game mode, <laughs> but theoretically similar. But then the Osiris DLC comes later. It's really weird. So, so like, two very and... similar fucking things. Okay. <laughs> Sweep had touched on this um, in chat uh, that PvP games take too long for the possibility of one blue. Whereas if you're... And I know that, like, they want you... Like, the main story is where the bulk of your content is, and they want you to be doing a lot of that stuff. But, I mean, I was bitching about it last night. <clears throat> Hove had to call me out on it. I was like, well, I guess the Better Devils is going to be my white whale that I'm looking for because it takes me about over an hour to get one package. And that's just from um, the uh, tokens that you get from a game. You get one if you win or one if you lose. Yeah, there's daily challenges or whatever that net you a couple more. But the, the grind in PvE felt much more rewarding. There was loot explosions. I was being overwhelmed. In PvP... You know, like, yeah, you get a chance of an end game drop, but if you're like me, dude, it was nothing but armor. And I was at, like, the end of my... I was like, okay, I've been playing PvP all day. This is my last chance to level up and get the better devils for tonight. And I got it, and I was super stoked, and I'm even more excited to go back into PvP and play with it. But I feel like the amount of PvP rewards that you get is such more of an unenjoyable grind because that's the mm. only way that you can get that better devils is through how, PvP. How long were you in PvP in order to get it? 
Um, well, I had done some that, uh, you know, I had played a little bit, you know, five, six hours here and there the couple days before. But yesterday, that was my main mission was just PvP all day. And I didn't get it till close to like 10 o'clock at night. When did you start? I want to say like I did. I started with some PvE in the early morning. I'd say like early afternoon, maybe around like two or three. Didn't Shit. get it till about ten, and that was the only weapon PvP that I had gotten to drop all day. In seven had, or eight hours. I had yeah, gotten nothing. PvE. Beastly, listen, I can tell you stories, Beastly. <laughs> in year two, I spent all of year two the entire sniper rifle meta without a thousand yard stare. The sniper rifle of year two, or a longbow synthesis with a good roll on it. There were two meta sniper rifles, and they just eluded me for a year. I had In both. year three, the party crasher suddenly became the meta weapon, right? It was everybody running around with party crashers. Six months, motherfucker. It took me six months to get a fucking party crasher. <laughs> <laughs> like a month later, they as nerfed much it. as you play, that's <laughs> a, crazy. A month later, they fucking nerfed it. Yeah, I'm sitting like here that. bitching about the whole time of the story. <laughs> hold on, hold on. it took you six months to get it. You finally get it, then they nerfed. They nerfed it a month later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the story with me with like Black that's Hammer and awesome, stuff from bro. Crota. It's pretty savage, but the I'm complaining about it, and Ke and Hove had called me out on this. He goes. Uh, I was like, well, I guess this is going to be my white whale. And he goes, you've been playing the game for three days. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, it, he kind of put me in check there. But then it kind of made me realize maybe it's not the grind for the reward itself. It's that there aren't enough to rewards to feel like you have a chance of getting this weapon. There's many times that I go to the gunsmith and preview the weapons that you can get. And I'm like, I don't have that one. I don't have that one. And... A couple more engrams later, I'll have one of them. You know, I definitely didn't feel that way with PvP. I felt like, well, shit, you know, I got to level up. Let's pray to RNG Jesus that I get something that isn't a complete pile of shit, you know, a.k.a. anything but the better devils. Because that's all nice I wanted thing, though, at that point. Is that when you do get that better devils, you don't get a shitty roll, right? That's true. I, how many IS Lunas did you get that were just absolute garbage? Only one. Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you guys have been screwed over thoroughly by Destiny oh, over the last three you years. You guys may know that I play World of Warcraft, still do, uh, on occasion. Not so much since D2 release, but I'll be uh, dipping back in for the 7.3 patch. The reason I bring it up is World of Warcraft knew that they had a problem with PvP. They had a game where the PvP population was dying. People were playing PvE because the loot was more bountiful, more fulfilling, People had the same issues. You know, I play a long game and I'm, I've got to grind up a hell of a lot of stuff to get rewards. I could just go and do PvE. So what they did with um, World of Warcraft was add PvE bounties. Specific, you know, a limited amount per day in the same way we get challenges. That you're doing quests for the PvP vendors on the map. So it's like world quests or what we would call uh, flashpoints or, you know, public events, etc. Or challenges that give you pvp tokens and pvp loot or chances at pvp engrams do you think that it would be sensible for them to open up that loophole to people that just cannot stand the crucible but might want to get some of the crucible loot and couldn't bear to do you know that 14 hour grind to get a hand cannon when you know they still want that loot and but pve is their bag or do you think that would dilute the player population further do people only do pvp for loot there is kind of a way already, um, and granted, you only get one chance a week, but the new clan integration, um, where you and your clan are doing things out in the world and gaining XP towards a level, which, like, if you play a certain amount of Crucible matches, um, you get a Crucible engram for your entire clan to cash in. So, in other words, me, Briar, and Gary are playing Crucible, and we're gaining, we're gaining XP for our clan towards a Crucible engram that will give you a Crucible weapon. However, that is one engram a week for the people who don't like to play Crucible. That's their one chance a week to get a Crucible weapon without going into the Crucible. So if if they could kind of tune that up a little bit, and like another thing that like I'm not maybe not realizing and it just kind of dawned on me was we're within the first week of the game I don't think they quite want to crank it up to 11 just yet maybe they want us to like get in you know it sure it's artificial lengthening of content when you kind of slow down people's progression that way but maybe 
in a future update, we'll see things like bounties that specifically reward a hand cannon or specifically reward a sniper. I don't think they want you to be like, like, I shouldn't have been able to be like, I want a better Devils, and then maybe even get one within two days. Maybe that was too soon. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're and, right. You know, maybe they just kind of want to slow it down, and then when things maybe kind of run dry or, like, slow down as far as content, maybe then they'll ramp it up, you know, like the, the amount of loot that you get. Maybe they just don't want to fucking crank it up to 11 yet, which I can totally understand. Yeah, we should... We should also note that there are a bunch of activities that Bungie actually kind of laid out in a roadmap for the next month or so. You know, we got this faction rally that's coming up. The raid obviously drops next week. Trials of uh, the Nine comes out next week. Like, there's over the next month, we've got a bunch of activities. Some are brand new. We don't know anything about yet. And like, I'm kind of hoping, who knows at this point. I'm kind of hoping that we get one of these once a month. It's like this kind of new roadmap for each. That would be month. awesome. It would be great. It'd be awesome. And like eventually they'll start repeating content in that roadmap, but it'd be nice. You know, the iron banners come in October, you know, that's a, you know, very PVP heavy thing where you get, you get specific PVP loot trials of the nine, assuming if it works similarly to the trials of Osiris, there will be specific PVP loot. I kind of like your idea, Gary, where, you know, maybe there is a way to get that PvP loot without necessarily having to go into the Crucible if you're really just not a Crucible player because there always will be specific Crucible loot, right? The Trials of Osiris, that stuff was very desirable. Even a lot of the Iron Banner gear over the years was very desirable. A lot of people grinded hard at the Iron Banner, especially in year one. It would be very difficult. So I wouldn't mind if all of a sudden, you know, better devils, there's some other way to get it. Yeah, I mean, and it could go both ways. You know, it might be people that are exceptionally good at PvP, but hate the PvE experience. If you're you know, the equivalent of the lighthouse chest in Destiny 2, if that had one piece of raid gear from the new raid that was in that, if you went for I don't know. I don't know if raid gear is the right example there. Oh, or, but top end PvE gear then. You know, something that was exclusive yeah. that was difficult to get. Because, I mean, getting flawless is... Pretty equivalent, I'd say, to clearing a boss of a raid. For sure. Somewhere in For there. sure. But, well, you know. like, at the very top end, I'd want to keep it exclusive to that specific content, right? Is I would not want Trials of the Nine gear dropping in PvE. I wouldn't want Iron Banner gear Agreed. dropping in PvE. Yeah. And I wouldn't want raid gear dropping in PvP, no matter what. Like the it, it very top the, end. the need for that stuff. Yeah, yeah, maybe for those top tier things. Like I like looking at a guardian and going, like knowing what he did to achieve. I that. know. Yeah, you you would. There's certain to do that. there's certain things. Like they're not going to look at me and be like, "Oh, he's got a better devils. Um, he must have grinded his dick off the other night for it." You know what I mean? Like they're going to just assume that it dropped at the end of a game or whatever. Whereas, like you saw someone with like an adept blind perdition and it was gold. You, you knew that at some point in time that they had done it, that they had went flawless, whether, you know, they carried, got carried, everyone pulled their weight. The experience was they made it. And that loot shows that. So maybe not for the top end stuff, maybe just for the, maybe just for the mediocre stuff. But I mean, like, like I was saying about the PVP engram, there is one of those as well for the raid yeah. in your clan roster. Yeah. Um, another thing too, we're talking about the amount of loot and like how there is a lot, but in some places we want more. Some of those clan rewards, when you get to a certain level, man, it looks like it's going to turn the loot up. Like it was saying, yeah. uh, chances of more engrams from pretty much any activity you can think of. So maybe we're just not seeing that yet. You know, maybe it's early yeah. judgment of mine to be like is, they need to kick it up. Very early to be talking about any kind of end game or reward system because we just we're, we're really we're. First of all, we're in a soft cap, right? Like, we're literally, I know that Gary and, and Wilson and I are really actually bumping our heads against that level cap right now. We're trying, we, we, that's why we started new characters today. We start to try and, you know, work our way around it. Uh, so, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to look at these endgame systems right now. In a month, in a month, you know, we'll have a better idea. In two months, we'll have an even better idea. And then they'll change it probably for the first DLC. I mean, to, to cap off the um, the PvP discussion and move on to talk a little bit more about Endgame, I do like your, your point there about looking at people and knowing what they've done by their loadout and equipment and talking about looking people and knowing about what they've done. The PvP emblem, who here has seen the big swinging dick emblem 
the, uh, the the new PVP emblem for the Crucible. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it literally asks you to unzip and get your member out and, and see how big it is. Swing it, it over the shoulder. Posts, this thing posts your KD, your, your KDA, or kill, deaths, and assistance stat on your emblem. So what do we think for the new um, LFG for trials? Are people going to have to flash that? And if it's not 12 inches and above, Damn. people are just not getting Damn. invited into uh, any groups there. Well, I, mean, I know you're excited think... about it. You had referenced your 3.0 KD about... 3.0 times today when we played so <laughs> <laughs> awesome. i just i wanted to make the reference so someone would call me out on it there and i could do humble brag on it but uh but yeah no it's it's there um so if anyone wants to flash their immense kd then uh, feel free to put on the crucible emblem uh, Talking about England, but um, before we move to the next topic this is something that i, I wanted to ask you guys about the main enemy, Gaul. No one really mentioned him. Do you guys think he's formidable? Does anyone have any particular thoughts on this particular character? It was amazing. He wasn't just the dude who wanted to show up and fuck shit up because that's what he does. Like, he was conflicted. Smart as hell. He was smart. He was conflicted. I feel like under, under different circumstances, like... And this may be like way out of left field, but like I feel like could under have been certain a speaker di- or something under like different circumstances that we could have potentially, I don't want to say like allies or anything, but like it might he, it kind of felt bad for him after a while, man. Like it, like he was definitely conflicted. He wasn't like this is my clear path to victory, and this is what I need to do, and I'm gonna break anything that gets in my way. Like he was definitely. I don't want to know if the words consider it, but like he's smart. Like it was chess to him. It was a big chess game. You know what I mean? And uh, I feel like under different circumstances, I, I don't know. It might have, it might have played out a little differently. Like the couple I, I agree, didn't man. seem like mindless space turtles who blow up planets for getting in their way. Like they they had thought process. They had uh, they have like a hierarchy. They have like a, a structured society. You know, they, sure they just happen to be good at blowing shit up. You know what I mean? Hmm. But it was cool to get some insight of just not this space turtle charging at me because it wants to kill me. Yeah, I, I felt the same way, you know, uh, progressing through the, the campaign and listening to, to the confliction that was going on within him and understanding how much respect he had for the traveler and all this other stuff that was going on. I haven't gotten to the end, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen. It seems like, like you said, in, a, in another world, he could have been an ally or, or someone very important to the guardians uh it's just so weird to me how this whole situation for him turned out and he seems so different from what i guess uh history of what what this race of of space turtles has been a very intelligent uh enemy and to me i think he's probably going to go places unless he something bad happens to him at the end of this campaign <laughs> it almost seems like he could almost potentially have been reasoned with yeah you know what i mean like the way that uh I always forget his name. Uh, homeboy that's always talking over his shoulder. Console. Con- yeah, he's with, yeah. With the jacked up face. Yeah, his little yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah. He's got all the 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 dead ghosts and the the hunter yeah. helmet and stuff on there. Uh, I feel like you know it, he was definitely like pressured into his position and that he could be persuaded. You know, he had he was relatable. He wasn't so alien to me mm. at that point. Like he could be persuaded. He had conflictions and things like that much similar as to people do i I just appreciate that a character like that with so many layers that gives the player something to consider something to really think about versus just um, a one-dimensional enemy you know just uh, cannon fodder something to shoot at or something to aspire to destroy to actually see uh, uh, an enemy that is really conflicted within himself. Uh, it just gave me a lot to think about. And I'm still thinking about it because I haven't completed the campaign. But I just wanted your thoughts on that. Briar, uh, Briar or Gary, you guys have any thoughts on Gaul? I I liked him. I didn't love him. Um, if, uh, it's hard to talk about him too much without being spoilerific, especially okay. at the end there. Um, he's... It, it, you know, at least he had a voice. At least he had motivations, which I think is far better than anything else we've seen from mm-hmm. a Destiny uh, antagonist. Um, yeah, that's, that's like it's really hard to talk about him without like knowing what I, spoiling anything. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, Gary. Would you like to move us forward to our next? 
Destiny 2 topic, my friend. Onwards and upwards, end game. Um, so all of us here are either at the end of the game or approaching the end of the game, and we've been there now for a couple of days trying to do our best to progress on. Is it still fun after you've done it all once? And that's the, the question that I've got, because in Destiny 1, we had the strike playlist. And the strike playlist was really your go-to place. If you wanted a PvE, you know, your Nightfall, your Heroic Daily, and say in the strike playlist with three buddies, and you ran through, what, eight strikes or whatever we had, nine strikes, sort of cycling through them. I think I've played two strikes, maybe, in Destiny 2. Um, I've been repeating and repeating the same public events that I've now played 50 plus times, if not more. There's only four public events, what, maybe five? I don't know, not a huge amount of variance. Uh, and they're the same on all planets. You know, the, the ether mining is the ether mining wherever you do it. Is this interesting progression for you moving forward? Um, or do you think this is, again, bare bones foundation and more is going to be built out as to how to progress? Because I'm just thinking the next wave of Guardians that hit, uh, as BC has, hit the, 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 the end of the game at like 210 that's a, a big gulf between 210 and raid ready, which if you're doing it in strikes is a very, very long slog. And if not, it's very repetitive to grind public events. And it's also not very clear um, that that's what you've got to do. It's not that the signposting of finding the fun seems to fall apart. What's your guys' thoughts on on that sort of difficult period of 210 to 280? Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be difficult. But uh, from what I've seen so far, I'd much rather... Uh, do the public events and do the strikes. Uh, strikes are very time consuming. And for the most part, you'd be very lucky if you get the loot that you need uh, to actually hit that raid ready mark. And from what I've seen, I got my first exotic and legendary Ingrams from uh, actually doing public events. And that's that moment where you scream, you know, you're like, holy shit. Yeah, I mean, so excited. And, you know, I actually got that there. And so I, I would much rather stick with these type of events to take 10 minutes, you know, and you can run from planet to planet doing them all day long. But for what I've seen, I've done, I've done six strikes. I've gone through the playlist twice and I haven't gotten anything close to that. So I would definitely, and, and yeah, it is. It, if you say there's only like five or six right now, it's, that's pretty damn repetitive, but you know, I guess it's an ends to the means, a means to the end. If you want that, uh, if you want that loot, strikes need uh, a a loot upgrade. They need a higher percentage chance of getting legendaries, higher percentage chance of getting exotics. Uh, players are going to go to where, especially right now, where they're going to get the most loot the fastest because that's the situation that Bungie presents us with. If you want to go into the raid next week, you got to grind as hard as you can, as fast as you can. Right now, the fastest way to level up is by uh, going into patrols and doing public events, doing public events because it, you, you're kind of you're hitting a bunch of different things. You've got a chance to get uh, engrams from doing the public event itself. You're also earning planetary reps so that you, you got a chance to get or you're going to earn engrams from doing that. You're earning gunsmith reps so you got a chance to get engrams from that or you're going to get engrams for that. So like there's the public events is just hitting it's. It's hitting the sweet spot right now for how to get loot the fastest because it's just it's just right there. Strikes, it's just a slower progression system. The strikes they built out are fucking phenomenal. Yes, and I can't wait to actually you know have some more time to spend in there. Um, and if they do make it a you know a more rewarding experience, then there will be more reasons to just go in and grind that playlist if you're a PVE guy. But you've also got, you know, the adventures on the side. You've got the dailies. You've got, you know, you got the dailies for each planet. You get the weeklies kind of for all your activities. So, like, as long as they keep making that stuff very rewarding and they kind of change the targets, you know, if next week – the strikes become a very rewarding way of doing it. If they could change where the most rewarding place Ooh, is week awesome. to week, then the variety of grinding in PVE will change. And I think that could add to the the length of time that people enjoy Destiny for. Yeah, that, that will change the repetitive nature of what you've got to do as far as your grind. Because I would much rather play through 
a strike than uh, do a public event. I enjoy that scenario, the way they built it up and the places you I go. I actually the like the public events see. right now, Beasley. One of the things I like about public events is it's so fucking random. You got blueberries coming out of nowhere. You know, you're trying to communicate. If you're alone, you're trying to, like, get the heroic version of the public event to trigger. And meanwhile, you got a blueberry killing everything in sight with a super before you can you can kill the fucking fallen lunchbox. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's fucking craziness. <laughs> Plus, I don't know. Like, right now, I'm really enjoying public events. You know, it's 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 the new new for me. Uh, so you, public you events gotta, are super fun. If you and, open a public event singly, uh, it, it triggers heroics? Because I haven't been alone yet. My wife's been with me the no, whole So time. there's certain activities for every public event that you could do that will trigger a heroic mode of the public event. So for the glimmer farming one, for instance, there's these little boxes. Gary called them the fallen lunch box. I just thought that was perfect. That spawns in... <laughs> And if you blow that up, you gotta do you gotta blow three of those up. So every time that glimmer farm moves, you know the glimmer, it, it, it moves three times. You gotta blow it up each time. If you blow it up, it triggers the heroic version of that, and the the amount of loot that drops is basically doubled. So instead of getting a chance at one engram, you get a chance at two engram. So it's worth doing, but if you're with a bunch of blueberries who don't know to do that. And they're just killing all the enemies before you can blow up that lunchbox because the lunchbox has huge amounts of health, right? Like mm -hmm. if you, it might take you, I don't know, five clips of primary ammo to blow that thing up if you're the only one working on it. Meanwhile, you got some idiot pole dancer coming in and just wiping out the all the fallen that are there, and everything and triggers something else to yeah. the next spot, and so you never have a chance to do that heroic event. He thinks he's helping. That's the funny part. He comes in and he's a <laughs> with this pole dance. And he's Look like, at me, oh, I'm a pole dancer. Pole dancer. <laughs> he's, he's waiting for everyone to be like, yeah, good job. And everyone's like, dude, like he we could have got more loot. Up. But right. public events are definitely the place to be right now if you are looking to gain as much light as quickly as possible. However, I... <sighs> Briar nailed that we said that's the situation that Bungie presents us with. But yeah, sure, strikes and PvP aren't as rewarding, but it is nice knowing that there are some other activities, even though they're not as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, maybe lucrative, you know, they're not as rewarding, yeah. awesome to get rewards from, but it is a change of pace. Like I was at the end of my rope trying to get that damn better devils last night. <laughs> and it felt so good when I got it to go into strikes and do something with a little change of pace. The strikes are amazing. So I don't want to spoil any of them because they're that amazing. Like, they're really good. They, fantastic. Um, they get me very excited for what's coming with the raid. There's a particular strike uh, that has one of the coolest skyboxes I've seen since Oryx. Um, since Oryx is shit. You know what I mean? It just, I got that vibe of like I was on the Dreadnought. It was a very tall ceiling, some very uh, interesting architecture and stuff. And um, it's got me really excited for what's in the raid. Uh, I'm the type of gamer, man, that I like to get lost and like I'll be with some friends, but like, you know, I'll get really immersed into the strike, like trying to listen to the story, like looking around, looking for things to scan. Um, I felt like they did a good job with that. Uh, as far as like, end game goes i feel like we're in a really weird end game position because it's not quite end game we're we're kind of like i wouldn't even know if we're really mid game <laughs> yeah it is it's a weird spot i gotta yeah. say the nightfall though they they have made the nightfall in my opinion stupendous yeah, yeah um, i was gonna mention that there nightfall is completely the antithesis of that point i made and if you want to elaborate on that that'd be perfect i haven't seen this Okay, so Nightfalls, you remember the Nightfall from Destiny, right? Where you mm -hmm. go in there, and in Destiny, vanilla Destiny, year one Destiny, what was cool about it was it was an ultra-hard version of a strike. Strike. That if you wiped, you were sent back to the beginning. Or you were sent to orbit, right? And you had to start it over again. Eventually, over time, they really dumbed down the Nightfall to the point where it almost didn't feel like a different version of the strike at all, Right? It, it literally was not that much harder than just running a regular strike. In Destiny 2, what they did is they put a timer on it. 
They amped up the difficulty. There's more heroic enemies. There's this week there's burns. We'll have to see what, you know, what other modifiers pop up week to week. But they put a timer on it. 10 minute timer. And then if you kill a red health bar enemy, you get 2 seconds added to your timer. If you kill a yellow health bar enemy, you get 7 seconds added to your timer. So it's a constant battle of how many of these fuckers should I fight? Like, is it worth my time oh, to fight man. these guys? Should I be running past them? Can I take these guys out fast enough to get this done in that 10-minute timer? It's fun. It's gonna, Nightfall of Year 1 game got to them. the point where people were just sitting on a cliff somewhere sniping enemies with an icebreaker because it was dangerous and they didn't want to wipe. Mm-hmm. You don't have that option in in the new version of Nightfall because go you've yeah. got to go. It's fun. Damn, it's a it's a good change to Nightfall. When, when does that open up? It's open. Now. It's open. Yeah, it's open. I haven't seen it. We've been doing it. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, you gotta yeah. beat the oh, game. I'm sorry. You gotta beat the game. Yeah. Okay. You gotta beat the campaign. I'm so it's close. You gotta beat that campaign, man. Thinking. It's like the game changes at that point. I'm beating it tonight, bro. I'm supposed Do it, to be man. going to sleep. What the fuck are you waiting for? I'm beating it tonight. I don't give a fuck if I'm late to work tomorrow. And yeah, I'm saying it on camera. Fuck you, work. Oh, <laughs> damn. Yo, tweet that to Beast's yeah. workplace. Can we clip that and send that damn to his it. boss? Yeah. <laughs> I'll fuck work. I'm grinding. You guys just don't want to see me in a house anymore. <laughs> oh, I agree. It's the, the, the nightfall. And I don't think that the difficulty um, with us being under leveled in terms of light, granted, it's a 240 activity. We were doing it at mid 260s to 270s and it was still yeah. pretty tricky to do yeah. um i don't think even once you're 300 that it's necessarily going to um ever regress back to one guy soloing it with an icebreaker or equivalent as you say um Bri, because of that timer i think the timer the fact that it's a hard cap you know if you do not finish it in this time doesn't matter anyway you're going to orbit i think that really forces aggressive play mm-hmm. and it it makes the nightfall something different and i think it will continue to make the nightfall something different no matter what gear level you're at um oh, and there's also you know, a prestige think, mode of it yeah because yeah, yeah. i mean in, in destiny one. one there were people there were people who would solo these type of events yeah. and uh to see that to see the first person that actually tries that with this 10 minute limit. Oh, they will. They'll get it They're done. It'll be a fucking Destiny 2 god. It's not Slayerage. It'll be, uh, what was the guy that soloed um, Rise of Iron Raid? Something uh, Crow? I think I he was remember. Briar Rabbit, maybe. Yeah, that's yes. it. They, I was way off. <laughs> crow, I, animal was, I was way off animal. my animal yeah. spectrum there. Uh, crow, Rabbit. Uh, now, somebody will do it, dude. Before like, we, it'll uh, happen. Before we leave, guys, because we're, we're approaching our time, we. Didn't go through all the Destiny 2 goodness that we had uh, listed for you guys. But Mr. Wilson here had a great topic that we all decided pre-show to cover before we left today. So would you like to get us started, Mr. Wilson? Yeah, man. I mean, it's a pretty basic, like, loose topic for the most part. Uh, You know, we've been... We've all been putting some serious hours into this game. And some of us more than others, you know, just because somebody's put... 40, 50 hours into it already doesn't mean that somebody who's somebody put... prioritized family and work. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it doesn't mean that they haven't put a lot of their time into the game. So, with that being said, uh, I myself, when the game came out, did like a 26 hour, 26 plus hour Marathon. Uh, grind of the game. So, my question to you is when, when, when the hell was the last time you did that for a game? Like, <laughs> And, like, at age 30, like, it's getting tough, dude. Like, yeah. 30 plus years old, man, it's getting tough, dude. Like, I, when the hell was the last time you guys stayed up, like, for a game like that? Well, let me just say, by the time you hit 37, Wilson, you're going to think about that and say, hmm, maybe I'll just read uh, stories to the kids and go lay down. Uh, honestly, it's been a long time. Uh, not many games come out that are like Destiny that require such a, a, a rabid response for you to level up as quickly as you can to get to this certain point. There's new content coming in a week. This is kind of a seminal experience in the gaming world. I can't even think of another game, honestly, that sparks that type of, you know, uh, intense reaction once it's released. Of course, we've all played single player games, multiplayer games. That you, usually it's a single player experience. You want to see the end. A game like the last of us two would probably get that kind of experience from me. I want to see the end. Uh, 
but for the most part, it's been a very long time for me. I can't even remember, honestly, maybe Destiny 1 when it first came out. Uh, me and my wife sat like kind of like we did this weekend. We'll spend, you know, 20 hours together just going through the motions and enjoying and getting loot. And But honestly, it's, it sounds cliche. Uh, Destiny is the only game that I can recall in recent years that does that to people. Can you guys think of any game, barring maybe some PC offerings, that when it releases, it has pe- rabid fans playing it for hours and hours and hours for days like you? Wilson, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna take a guess for Gary here. I'm I'm sorry, Gary. Uh, World of Warcraft. <laughs> Close. Uh, Galgun man. When they released the, uh, the the panty snappy marathon, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty twenty four hours there. wasn't enough. That was it. My wife that had to just... peel him away from it, dude. She had <laughs> to put it. a password on the computer and limit his time. <laughs> like no more like panty like... snaps. I started getting RSI on my like camera finger, you know. I was clicking, <laughs> clicking um, you know, There's never enough time in the day to snap schoolgirls' panties. Oh man! No, it was um World of Warcraft. I think this is a bit of a um, a red herring for MMOs. So if you've come from a PC MMO background, the 24-hour grind is just like a Friday night with some buddies and some pizza. Damn! Like that's just what you do. Like you play through the night and you grind on and you do what you do. Um, so I've done that for many, many MMOs um, in recent history. But I think Blizzard games in general, or actually, I say Blizzard games are MOBAs. So things like um, Dota for for the Steam and, and League of Legends, you know, people will play that for like seventy two hours and pass out and die. You know, like Damn. those sorts of games are like they in, are not encourage, but I think they lend themselves well because there is no story. Like you mentioned, um, BC, that you play a story, but there's a finite end to that. A lot of the games that I chose to spend my childhood playing, um, or even for recent years, there is no end to them. There is no, there's no end level. You can't mm-hmm. get max level. You just you're playing it in infinity. You know, that's yeah. it. And I think that's what lends itself to it. But for me, real answer probably World of Warcraft was the last time I did a solid 24 hour grind, uh, and that was when I was back in vanilla going for Grand Marshal, um, which was like a PvP title. And you were competing with every other player in the server. So it was who had most hours got the title. Damn. Who had the biggest wow dick? Yeah. Wow. And uh, mine was like fucking Ron Jeremy style. It was a it was a big swinging <laughs> dick. But then I had hours. Has has any that you can remember, Gary? Has there been a console game uh, like Destiny, which is now a PC game, that has uh, elicited that kind of response from you? Uh, I can't remember anything uh, on this level that got people like so amped. You know, when it first dropped, before it came out, you know, we were talking about it. We got to get on it. We got to, you know, be raid ready in a week. Nobody really does that on consoles. Can you, Briar, do you guys, uh, can you think of anything that kind of gets that response from gamers on consoles? No, it's one of the unique things about Destiny, right, is it offers that MMO light experience on consoles. You know, it's just not a, it's not a thing that's really been available. Uh, yeah, it's it's unique all its own, yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, for me, the last time I did it, obviously, was a Destiny. Uh, you did that for like four years straight. <laughs> it, it was the Taken King, though. When the Taken King dropped, and the the DCP podcast decided to, you know, do an attempt at Worlds first, we had three days to get ready. Right, we had from Tuesday to Friday to get raid ready. Damn, and we were giving it a <laughs> shot. We were going hard. So it was literally, I was sitting in front of the front of the PlayStation grinding as hard as I could looking for every opportunity, looking for everything. And what it was in destiny, in destiny one during the taking King time period, the way to grind was to run strikes. And I think there were two new strikes, maybe three new strikes, but most of the strikes were just old strikes. <laughs> like they were the same strikes we'd been playing for a year. That grind was pretty hard. I'm not going to lie because Damn, you're mainly days. playing for three days, mainly playing old content. So you weren't even playing the new content, which was a bummer. I, I did not like that. Damn. And that's why I don't really miss the fact that strikes aren't like that big a deal <laughs> for the grind right now because we did it for the Taken King and then we did it again for Rise of Iron. It was the same thing in Rise of Iron. The best way to level up was run strikes. And again, most of the strikes 
we're not two years old. <laughs> They were perfected now. Yeah, I yeah. do. I do like the effort that they put in towards like kind of changing up some of the old ones in D one. Um, I'm right there with you, Briar. Last thing for me was Taken King. Uh, I believe that dropped around four in the morning for me, maybe closer to five for you. Um, I tried to go to sleep that night. I think I got like maybe <laughs> like two minutes worth of sleep. Um, but I got up at four. Actually, I was a little late. Uh, I got up at like 4.15, everyone waited for me, and then I made them wait longer because I was crabby and needed coffee. So I went and got coffee, and that was the last time I had stayed up for 24 hours to play one particular video game. Before that, I don't think I've ever done it, dude, for one particular game. There's definitely times that I've stayed up for 24 hours to play multiple games. Never one particular game like that. It's just... You know, it's not only the game itself, but, like, y your friends getting excited and, like, you getting excited. It It's a symbiotic thing that just builds so much hype and you get so excited. And, like, you're not only excited for the experiences that you're going to have, but that your friends are going to have or maybe that you'll have together. And, and your friends are relying on you, too. Like, you know, part of it is yeah. you're going in as a six-man team and everybody in that six-man team has to hold their hold their own. So it's a big deal. You know, like you don't want to be the guy that's holding your team back. You want to be the guy that's pulling your team forward. Yeah, so, as much as you can. Yeah, you grinding know? as hard as you can is kind of part of that. Part of that. Part of that world's first race isn't necessarily who can figure out the raid the fastest, but also who can get leveled up. You know, who can who can put in the time in the time you're provided to get that done. It's a bitch, but it's fun. You know, it's part of the fun to me. It is definitely. I had. So it was funny. Destiny 2 dropped. I stayed up for 24 hours. Uh, Sam hit me up. She's like, hey, let's go get let's go get some coffee in the morning. And we're at the drive-thru, and I'm getting my extra large, you know, six bucks coffee. And uh, she's like, so what time did you end up calling it last night? And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of looked over at her, and I was like, are you serious? And I was like, I'm... I, 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 I haven't call. called it yet. We, we're still, <laughs> we're still going. And she's we're like, "Are you doing she, this?" <laughs> jokatively, you know, with a smile, she's like, "Are you serious?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I told you I was gonna go fucking hard when this thing came out. Like, you nailed it. Like, it, there's people it's depending on me going. too. You know, we depend on our friends. You know what I mean? Like, there's, there's been a lot of people that have helped me with activities already, and there's been a lot of people that I've helped with activities, and it's fun. I'm gonna do it again. I'll probably do it again for. Uh, for the Osiris DLC or something. Who knows? Maybe I'll get up early. It depends on when it drops. Oh, man, One of my see. favorite moments so far, actually, was there's a there's a quest right now that you have to do the Nightfall even faster than that 10-minute timer. Right? you got to have five minutes left on that timer to complete that quest. Yeah. What? Gary, how, how did we grind that for two two hours, three hours? Something like that. We, um, we tried it with... Um... A uh, friend of a friend, I think, an extended guy, and, and I think uh, we were struggling because he hadn't got quite, you know, high enough light there. Um, so best efforts, we were just, I think, like forty-five seconds short. You know, really close. Really we, close. We grinded it. We you guys did it, it in well, less than six part, minutes. Part well, of it was us uh, getting the strap together as well, wasn't it? You know, and and we yeah. were learning as a group. Um, and we brought in one of your brothers from Rezo, uh, Papa Bear Mars. Shout out, and. Um, well, I think we took us two or three more attempts with him in there just to get it right and get it perfect. But there was a real feeling of um, that we'd earned that exotic weapon, you know, because we really we did a, a segment and then figured out how we could get more time in that segment. And we did the next segment and figured out how could we get more time there? I don't know that for me, that was one of the first times I've actually enjoyed PVE. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it felt it was a similar feeling to Raiden. You know, it was like trying to figure out each encounter, how to maximize each encounter, you know, you didn't, you didn't have to figure out the mechanics of a raid so much as just how to get through it as fast as fucking possible. <laughs> so did, did you guys decide like certain pockets of enemies just to blow them up as quickly as you could to add time? Yeah. So, so like you get, bypassing you start with, entire like, 11, areas. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you start with 11 minutes and you have to make the distinction of, do I stay and fight these guys? And sometimes you're forced to, you have to kill a certain number or a certain one to advance to the next area. So it's kind of a, a juggle between staying and fighting, and if you're going to stay and fight, you have to make up time by killing enemies and gaining seconds on the timer. Like, 
Otherwise, you're just wasting time and you're not even closer to the end goal. So you got to figure out when to go, when to stay, when to shoot, when to run. And it's like Briar said, it's not quite raid mechanics, but the feeling was there of like dire need to get through this and stay alive and not disappoint your fire team. You know, you don't want to be the guy that went down when solar burn pops up and you're the guy with all the solar. You know what I mean? Or you're the solar subclass. Yeah. You know, like so the the uh the angst, the feeling of oh shit, we gotta get we gotta do this is definitely there. And I thought it was an amazing touch. I hope we see more stuff with a similar pattern yeah. or similar yeah, the, communi- uh, the communication that it encouraged as well. And I know Bungie loves that um into fire team chat and bonding you as a as a group. I know that's a big thing that they like. They like player interaction. And the cycling burns, the fact that it was like void, solar, arc. You were calling it out to each other. You were like, I got this, I've got the arc, you know, I'm gonna go up and take them on. Like we were we were talking so much um throughout that nightfall. There was a constant stream of communication. Whereas a lot of the time when you're in a fire team in Destiny, you're just talking about the shit you watched on HBO last night. You know, it's not like it's not about the mission, but yeah. that was like focus talk all of us relaying information it was yeah that felt like um you know an intense firefight in PUBG to call it back you know where you're calling out every little thing that you see and it i haven't had that in destiny for a long time and that that was really uh, i think a a good touch yeah high octane it was in the year one nightfall was a blow i thought they they kind of ruined the nightfall i thought in year two and they really brought it back you know that that's a fun thing now I just wanted to say real quick, because uh, Destiny 1, I had a lot of gripes with it. And who knows what's going to happen in the future with Destiny 2. But I've already put in close to 20 hours in this game. Uh, just going through the campaign, I played you know, a handful of matches inside the Crucible, some strikes. I've gotten well over my money's worth here already. Um, you know, I, I bought the Deluxe Edition. I paid 100 bucks for it. But me and my wife have, have bonded over this game over a weekend, sitting side by side, having a fucking blast. And it's just so much more to come. Uh, I'm really excited for this year, Briar. I told you I was going to do this. I'm going to stick with Destiny 2 for a year. I said that on on live TV, too. So uh, I'm really excited about it. And, you know, at this point, I don't have any regrets. You know, Destiny 1, after I played it for, you know, a week or two, I was like, there's really nothing left to do here. I feel like I've already seen everything I wanted to see as far as the story, as far as the arc of my character. And on top of that, there's two other classes I've never tried. It's just, it leaps and bounds to me at this point beyond what Destiny 1 was. And I can't wait to see what they do next, man. Should we wrap this one up, guys? I think it's about time. I think we could go, go on all night. Destiny. So we got to it. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we got. We could talk about it all night, or we could play it all night. <laughs> and everybody in the comments, let our friend Gary Diaz know how young he looks. I told him pre-show. I said it's hard not to love you because you look like just a wholesome little boy. And I just watched Stephen King's It. He could have been a part oh, of the cast. Wait, 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 wait. Can, uh, can, we, can we pause uh, that? Can we step? A, take a step back here. Put <laughs> that one back. Can Hold we, up, did we just rewind get confirmation? the track. Can we can chat confirm? Did BC just say he loves wholesome little boys? <laughs> I think he just I'm did. pretty sure I, I raised two of them, Gary. <laughs> you're just you're a lovable young man, okay? You look like a young kid. And and you know, I I've kind of just recently went through something watching one of the best movies of the year. And you know, you could be a part of the losers club. You look like you're twelve, man. The voice of an angel. He, you do. If angels talk. They probably talk just like you, Gary. Mm-hmm. And angels are some perverted bitches if they say anything like that. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> Shit. Oh, side note, guys. If you guys haven't yet, and I'm not getting paid by Warner Brothers, go see Stephen King's It. The movie was unbelievable. It's a must-see for anyone who likes horror, coming-of-age stories, great writing, great casting, and... Um, Pennywise the Clown doing some stuff that you've never seen him do before. Rated R. I took my four-year-old, my like seven-year-old. Spinning dishes on the pole thing. How'd you know? You read the book. Did like ten of them come out of one car? Ooh. <laughs> no, 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 no. He doesn't do that trick. But does he it's do like very, cartwheels. Like I've never seen him do cartwheels. No, he does. He, Can he paint he a house? Like... Can he paint my house? D- does he ask you he to wants. smell the flower, and when you go in to smell it, he squeezes it and it shoots oh, water out? Oh man, at you? that's the Joker. That's, what a scamp! Ah, okay, my bad. <laughs> What's his opinion on wholesome little boys? Is that is that also consistent with yours? 
He absolutely loves wholesome little boys. He bites them, and I don't. <laughs> so you take your pick, okay, Gary? Can confirm. He will not bite your wholesome little boys. <laughs> Just look at this smile and say it's not creepy, Gary. Oh, my God. Uh, I think we need to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out. Of course, if you prefer the audio version, we have it up on Podbean. We have it up on iTunes. iTunes. You can watch the uh, entire version on YouTube, either on Beastly Thoughts channel or on the Briar Rabbit channel. Of course, we record the show live. At 6 p.m. Eastern time every week over here on Twitch. Thank you all for hanging out. We're going to go play some more Destiny 2. We'll see you next week. Public events, baby. <laughs>